to order. Can we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This meeting is being live streamed by Telford Telemedia and posted to the CPS website for interested community members to access and watch. In person public participation will be taking place tonight in accordance with social distancing and safety protocols established by the Chelmsford School Committee public participation guidelines. Anyone interested in speaking during the public input portion of the meeting would notify the superintendent's office by yesterday afternoon has been provided with these guidelines and assigned a time to attend to speak. If anyone watching this meeting live has questions or comments to share, they're encouraged to email one of us during the meeting. We'll read their questions or comments during our second public input session at the end of the meeting. So welcome to this meeting of the Chelmsford School Committee. Uh, first item of our agenda is approval of the minutes from our meeting on January 18th. I make a motion. I make a motion to approve the regular committee meeting minutes of January 18th, 2022. As second. Well. Second. Okay. Any comments or corrections? All right. All in favor? Oh, yes. sorry, Donna. Uh, did we want to read, did we put that statement in the minutes? Yeah, we made, yeah, we, okay, it's, so it's in, in the there minutes. already? Yep. All right, Everything's perfect. in the minutes. Thank you. Yep. All right, uh, anything else? Okay, all in favor of approval? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Five zero. All right, next up are our student representatives. Hello, everyone. So we are just beginning term three with February break coming up in a few weeks, which is coming quickly. Um, also, the eighth grade parent meeting was last week on January 27th, and it was a very successful event, and parents got to come in and see where their child would be going to school and potentially get a tour of CHS by the NHS uh, members. Um, also, on February 7th, there will be a group called College Bound, Zooming with Chumsford Parents about how to save money for college, and this was organized by Ms. Cunningham in the College and Career Readiness Center. And last thing, um, on Friday, February 11th at 7 p.m., Lime will be hosting the annual In Tune concert, and uh, many musicians will be performing, and we hope to see you all there. All right, and to add to that real quick, so CHS's two a cappella groups, the Crescendos and the Thursdays, will be competing this weekend in Any Voices, so we wish them the best of luck. They're both two very talented groups and have won various awards over the years. Um, the mock trial team competed yesterday and did an amazing job. Um, we won against Arlington, so it was definitely a lot of fun. Hopefully, we'll get to perform again. We'll see. Um, a team of students led by seniors Michael Kella, Jenny Huen, Mahi Chava, and Larry Yang recently got a shout-out from Chelmsford Telemedia, the local TV news station, um, regarding their work on the new CHS door painting project. I know Katrina and I have definitely seen it around the school um, they've painted six doors so far with five more in the works. And it's basically, it shows off like the personality of the teacher in the room. So like, I know Mr. Bartos is getting like Snoopy painted on his door, like stuff like that. And it's just really fun um, to see that happening and see those students taking the initiative. So those are all our updates. Any questions for the student reps? All right, thank you very much. All right, any good news to share? Yep, yep we have a few pieces of good news. So. There's been some great turnout for the CHS travel um, trips that will be coming up. In 2023, they're going to the Galapagos Islands, and that trip is already full. So meeting happened. The students all signed up, and they're very excited. We do still have some um, openings in our Spanish and French exchange programs. So please go onto the website for World Languages, and you can find information there. Um, our middle school students went snowshoeing for the first time. So we had, they were waiting for the big storm last week, got all excited. I actually saw them out at uh, Parker today, and they've been outside having a, a grand old time. Our CHS performance classes are getting ready for the Disney performance trip that they'll be going on this month. And McCarthy Middle School is going to be, they're in full production right now to be doing Moana Junior, which is this, uh, the 4th and the 5th, correct? So it's this week. Fr Friday, we, Saturday. Yeah, because today this is weekend. February 1st, everyone. And um, uh, we have a partnership so far with the Chelmsford Water Department as they are trying to build the pathway for science in life sciences. So it's great for the Chelmsford Water Department to be helping our CHS students. Great. Fantastic. All right, anybody else have any good news, Jeff? I, I just want to follow up with what Sarah said. I virtually attended the mock trial. And it's, it's difficult to do when you have to do it online and virtually. They did a wonderful job. I mean, working with Mr. Cole and the attorneys in town, the, 
all things considered, the difficulty did a great job. And I will say Sarah, under heavy grilling and cross-examination, did a phenomenal job. So it was very well done. It was very enjoyable and an interesting case, too. Great. All right, anybody else? Uh, Sarah, do you know if um, they're going to have um, an audience uh, for the crescendos and the Thursdays this weekend? Do you know I, what they decided about that? I don't know that answer, actually. Uh, I was just kind of curious. All right. All right, anybody else have any good news? Okay, great. All right, um, we're now to our first public comment section, but I don't believe we have any registered voters, uh, voters <laughs> registered speakers tonight. We don't. Okay. No. All right, so we'll move on to new business. Sure. So uh, we're going to jump right into uh, new business, and we have uh, friends from South Row Elementary School with us uh, here today. Um, our new principal, uh, Terry Gilbert, uh, joined us this fall, and Jason Romalo, our assistant principal at South Row. And uh, this is... Um, for each of our upcoming school committee meetings, we spotlight one of the different schools. Um, so Terry and Jason are going to tell us a little bit about some of the work happening at South Row. I'll turn it right over to you. Great. Thank you. Jason and I are really happy to be here. Um, it's nice to have an opportunity to come um, and not present like a school improvement plan and really be able to talk about some of the um, great things that we have going on at South Row. Um, what our presentation focuses on today are the, the partnering that we have done with um, students, staff, families, and community. Um, so the beginning of the year um, being new, so um, I would say that like during the interview process, I hope that I had gotten across the point that like relationships are the foundation of everything in my philosophy. And um, I feel like I landed in a, in a good place that is a good fit for me because that's what it is at South Row as well. Um, so our focus really at the beginning of the year was to make sure that students and families felt welcomed back at the school. Um, so over the summer, we had some play dates uh, so that students could come together, um, families could come together. Many of them hadn't seen one another in a long time as well. I had an opportunity to um, start to get to know people in the South Road community, um, and especially for those families that had been remote the previous year. So we wanted to make sure that they felt welcome coming back to South Row. Um, and we just made, wanted to make sure that we got the message across to families that um, we were going to pay close attention to all of the health and safety protocols, um, but that we wanted everybody to come back. And, you know, Dr. Lang had said right from the beginning, like, let's try to make this as normal of a year as possible. And um, I, I would say, like, we wanted to come families to feel comfortable, but we also wanted them to know that that really was our long-term goal this year. Yeah, so when we were thinking about kind of kicking off the year, I think there were, you know, three different things that we had to consider. Obviously, our students, our staff, our whole community, our families. Um, and as Mrs. Gilbert had mentioned, we did a, tried to do a lot of things this summer to really kind of get ourselves um, on par and ready to go for this school year. Um, we started off kind of our planning with doing a kindergarten orientation, um, which is a really important time for our new kindergarten families and coming in. Um, to get acclimated to South Row and get acclimated to Chumpsford. Um, of course, there were lots of questions, um, and we were able to hopefully answer them the best that we could at the time. Um, as Mrs. Gilbert mentioned, we did um, this year, um, we did kind of a meet Mrs. Gilbert uh, slash play date for each grade level. Um, in the past, we would just kind of focus on kindergarten as there are new grades coming in. But this year, we felt since we had students that were through the remote model uh, last year in person, brand new to South Row, we wanted to give them an opportunity to meet our new principal, but also kind of build relationships with one another. Um, we tried to communicate with families as much as we could over the summer. Uh, we provided moving on up videos so um, new students and families could see uh, the rising grade level. Um, we tried to be transparent with our reopening plans. And as we've been going through this whole process, um, you know, in the COVID world, um, trying to go one step at a time. Um, and as Mrs. Gilbert said, make the school year as normal as possible while also keeping everybody healthy. Um, and we were really fortunate to have our PTO support um, at these events um, to help us kind of jump start, get jump started on the school year. So tonight we're going to really focus on our partnerships, um, you know, both students, staff, community, families, and beyond. Um, so the, the one quick, um, the, the one, work, a lot of the work that we've done at South Row over the years are really focusing on our SEL initiatives and, of course, academics. Um, I know we've talked over the years about our SEL initiatives at South Row. Um, each students are really praised for um, and are rewarded for demonstrating positive expectations and our school-wide respect, responsibility, and safety uh, through pride tickets. Uh, so our students are excited to earn them. Um, they get to earn pride tickets individually for their classroom, for their grade level. And we also started last year 
um, our whole school rewards. Um, so recently we revealed our whole school reward, which I'll go over on the next slide. Um, and we have a big bulletin board in our main lobby, which you can see Caden up there popping what that big reward will be. Um, so the students were really excited to kind of take that to the next level. So again, student-based, classroom-based, school-wide-based. Um, Mrs. Gilbert had a great idea in coming in to really also highlight kids that might need a little bit extra than our pride tickets. Um, so we've done a pride shout out, which goes on morning announcements each day. Hamza is holding up a sticker um, that uh, represents that he got a shout out for doing something above and beyond, um, which is just in addition to some of our SEL supports. Um, and she emails uh, families uh, a picture of their child to try to build those relationships with families as well. It's always good to hear from the principal and assistant principal for positive things. Um, so families get excited about that. Uh, and we also started again as kind of like an extra tier one initiative uh, notes home kind of snail mail. Um, so it was a kind of a picture of just a happy thought or a happy note from South Row, uh, which our teachers have started to implement um, to just give kids an extra boost. For our whole school uh, reward, our students got our level for our whole school reward in the hallway um, and we revealed it was a door decorating challenge, uh, which our students and staff and even families got involved with, with helping us kind of come up with creative ideas for our doors. Um, it, the creativity um, was amazing through amongst our staff and our students, and I, we can't thank them enough. Um, and the theme for our um, doors were all about respect, responsibility, and safety, and kindness, um, which are really important uh, values that we have at South Row, in addition to our Pride Core values. And we did this kind of right in January. It worked out great when we were reteaching our expectations. Students had an opportunity to create their door, but it was also tied into our school-wide um, values and initiatives. So these are some examples um, of some of our doors. Uh, we have a big um, door decorating challenge where I think we're going to have a couple of VIP judges. Um, I've heard through the grapevine that might be coming to South Row on Friday to judge all the doors at South Row. So our kids are really excited to see who the winning door will be um, and also have an opportunity to go around the school to see all the different doors um, that the community um, spent time decorating. Uh, this video on this slide uh, features uh, students um, in Mrs. Stagnan's class uh, that, are, that talk a little bit about uh, the door decorating process. Um, Mrs. Stagnan's class got really into it, like all of our classes did, and their door was focused on kindness. are different like you should just be who you are what i enjoyed about it i really enjoyed that we all got to make a paper snowflake that was really fun and i think that the twinkle lights really made a big difference the, like we said the hearts um have a kind of act on them and i think it was fun, really fun to do this how we made it was we used a um, poster board for the snowman so it popped out and we took paper and we all cut out snowflakes out of the class which was really fun and we all got a little heart that we got to write on and um, we got help from someone to um, use a cricket machine for the word. Hi, so our class had a wonderful time decorating our door for our school-wide door decorating competition. Um, it was a really nice chance to have our whole school come together. Um, we're so excited to get to go check out all the doors in South Row. Um, we actually had some kindergarten visitors knocking on the door to tell us um, they liked our door. I had former students stop by, so it was a great opportunity and we're really looking forward to next week's competition. So as you can see, the students and staff really got into this and just even hearing some of the students messages um, really kind of, um, of course, brought together our expectations and our values that we teach at South Row, but they, they really enjoyed uh, the process and they're very excited for the challenge and a special thank you to Mrs. Stagnan and Emma, Claire and Trevor for being uh, willing to um, take a little video. The next piece when we're thinking about student partnerships um, is our student council leadership program that we have at South Row. Um, this is open to all fourth graders. Uh, there's an application process. Um, and this year, we're actually doing it during um, one recess block, one or two recess blocks a month. Again, it's optional to uh, take part of student council. 
And doing it this way has really allowed us to have more kids involved. We have close to 50 students involved um, in our fourth grade uh, group, and we split up on two different cohorts for health and safety purposes. Um, and they've really gotten into it this year. Um, you know, we pride ourselves, and this is a leadership opportunity. So there are student leaders in our building. Um, it gives them an opportunity to collaborate with Mrs. Gilbert and I to contribute um, ideas and decisions and even providing input on different items um, as a, um, on a school level. They have various tasks and jobs. Um, right now, we have students that are guest reading in classes throughout our building. We have our safety patrol. Um, we have kindergarten helpers. Uh, we have uh, students involved um, working with uh, Mrs. Gilbert and I to um, present at our student grade level meetings that we do monthly. Um, and they've really uh, come together to get involved in our school. Um, and I couldn't be more proud of this group. Um, we have a couple of students that talked a little bit about uh, student council uh, from their perspective. Um, so we have two different videos to share, one from Sienna and one from Mari. Hi, my name is Sienna DiGiovanni, and I'm in fourth grade in Mrs. Duncan's class, and I'm in student council. What I like about student council is I like to be a leader and show my fun ideas and do fun projects and help people. We do safety patrol, too, to make sure kids are safe. Hi, my name is Mari Lemmerman. I'm in fourth grade in Mrs. Duncan's class. I'm in student council. I love being in student council because I get to help out and get to do jobs and special activities. I also get to share my thoughts. In student council, we all get to participate and help. Some of the jobs we do is make posters and signs to show that we appreciate each other. We also read to grades and help kindergartners at dismissal, and that is why I love student council. So great testimonials for student council, and you can see um, how involved and how much they enjoy it. So a special thank you to Sienna and Mari. Okay, so uh, next we'll talk a little bit about some of the community partnerships that we have. So the Therapy Dogs, I know it's a district-wide initiative. Um, Peggy Gump helped out with that one. We have just been over the moon with the Therapy Dog visits. Um, and you'll, you'll see one of our, our students uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, she was so overcome on their first visit. Um, she was, had tears of joy. Um, so we did end up partnering with this uh, organization. She's a keeper also, and I'll just mention it briefly now, and, but it comes up later. Um, with our parent discussion night too because we just felt like um, it was such an important initiative in our um, during the school day that we wanted to make sure that parents had an opportunity to also um, be a partner with this organization. So our video is um, Haley Kula and she's going to talk a little bit about um, one of the therapy dog visits. They were 20 minutes of relaxing, fun, just cuddling adorable animals, and I really enjoyed it. Um, it reminded me of my dog, and I just really enjoyed playing with the adorable little animals. So we, we look forward to those monthly visits. Um, we wish we had been able to do it in person because I think that the parents would have really loved to see the dogs in person. But um, She's a Keeper did an amazing job on our virtual night as well. Um, one other partnership that we um, had, this was uh, in the fall and really was driven by Maureen Stone, so a shout out to her. Um, she is on our PTO and she w was able to work with us and some um, high school members to uh, do some black blacktop painting, give our blacktop a uh, facelift. So um, they were able to put a, a couple of hopscotch um, stencils out. And uh, the one on the left is called Mirror Me. It's a little bit like a Simon game. Um, and then the one in the middle is uh, Foursquare. We ran out of time weather-wise, um, but the Foursquare has been a huge hit. So we're hoping that we can get the crew back um, to put a couple more on our play pad out, outside. Um, so Officer High Five Friday um, is something new to South Row. Um, I think it's really important to um, partner with um, our men in blue, men and women in blue. Um, so they were very amenable and open to coming um, to visit us. Uh, we try to do it about once a month. 
Um, the kids absolutely love it. I will say that we do get some, there's some things posted on Facebook that people are all nervous because what's going on at South Row, but um, we always put it in the newsletters and all of that. So um, I think by this time people know that it's just High Five Friday. Um, but it, it's been really wonderful. Um, we're looking to expand, um, maybe do it with the fire department and sometime in the coming months. And if the school committee was interested in doing a high five Friday at, at any point, reach out and we will book a date for all of you. Um, so we have um, a couple of students, um, Preston and Carter Thornton, that are going to talk about High Five Friday. Um, their parents actually proactively reached out to us and said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. They love it. Um, and then our own Officer Govan also um, weighed in on video. Good morning, I'm Officer Gogan with the Johnson Police Department. I'm the school resource officer over at the McCarthy Middle School. Um, I remember meeting with Principal Gilbert back before the beginning of the school year and she mentioned um, doing the officer high fives on Fridays uh, during the school year. And um, I was very excited by that. Uh, any opportunity at all that police have to have a positive interaction with <coughs> the students and other members of the community is something definitely we should take advantage of. Um, since that time, we've done, I believe, four Officer High Five Fridays, and uh, I've had anywhere from, you know, three to six officers joining me, um, welcoming the kids into school with high fives and um, fist bumps, whatever they're comfortable with, um, since that time. And uh, it's something a lot of our officers enjoy doing when they get a chance to do it. I know it's the best day of my week when I'm able to uh, take part in the officer high five. And um, I think it's been really good in the way that we've had a lot of parents come back and mention you know, how much their kids love it and how much they like the idea that we're out there. Thank you. Um, so walk to school day is another initiative. Um, initially, that was a Department of Transportation um, initiative, but South Row has really kept it going. Um, and a uh, shout out to Lindsay Moran and Leanne Needham because they kind of do all the planning around this. Um, but it's all focused on safe routes to school. And uh, we usually have a pretty good turnout. Uh, we really try to do it once a month. I, I don't know if we, I don't think we've done it in January and with the snow, probably not. But <laughs> we will try to uh, do another one in February. Um, the kids really love it. Um, it, it it's really, it, it's really a positive thing and a positive way to start the day. Uh, so these videos um, are from Lindsay Moran, who helps organize it, and her son Cameron Moran talking a little bit about Walk to School Day. As a South Row parent, I love the community that the school has really provided for its students and families. It's important for me to try to get involved where I can, which is why I was very excited when they were looking for a volunteer for the Walk to School program. For this program, we try to host monthly Walk to School days where the students can come together and walk to South Row, although we all know winter can provide challenges to that, but that's our hope. It provides a fun and a new way for students to get to school and also fosters that collaboration and community feel as so many of the students come with their friends and neighbors. It, the students truly love it and it's so exciting to see the smiles on their face when they come and collect their walk to school sticker and they wear it proud throughout the day. Um, so I had mentioned parent discuss discussion night briefly. Um, we just had that um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were very fortunate to have um, a couple of Chelmsford District professionals, Josh LaFartoon and 
Katie Sims uh, join us on a kind of a night of wellness is what we called it. Um, in addition to, she's a keeper, the therapy dog organization. Um, so, you know, not, not only partnering with the, the families and the community, but really partnering with people um, within the district as well um, to make things work and, you know, bring a message to families. I think that, um, that that's a big focus for us as well. Uh, so we kind of tried to get feedback from families ahead of time and um, had them send in questions so that we could really focus the evening on what their concerns were. Um, and I think we have another video from, yeah. Um, so Jen Zugates, she is a parent and also a school council member, and um, she just provided a little bit of um, insight uh, as to her thoughts on parent discussion night. My name is Jen Zugates, and I am the parent of a first grade student at South Row and a member of the school council. South Row recently held a parent discussion night about anxiety in elementary age students. It was driven by questions that parents had, so it really addressed the most pressing needs um, of families in our community. As a parent, I very much appreciated the advice on how to parent in the age of COVID as it's been draining and at points confusing because as parents, we're not always sure what to do for our kids when things aren't going well. I also really appreciated the specific information about when to seek outside help for a student who might be depressed or anxious and how to go about doing that and the strategies that the presenters gave for helping a student to self-regulate in really intense emotional moments. The many parents that were involved in the discussion night very much appreciate the focus on mental health. Great job, South Row. Uh, we also have, um, I want to talk a little about some of the academic partnerships that we've had um, throughout the year. Um, of course, we're focusing um, and we want to focus on social emotional, but obviously the uh, academic pieces um, and just professional development for staff um, uh, is important. Uh, one big um, initiative that we um, have in a district and also have tried to take it on to as a school is over DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Practices. Um, the district has partnered with um, IDEAS, uh, which has provided our admin team, um, also all teachers, some professional development in the area of DEI. Um, it also, we also, as a Tier 1 SEL team, um, wanted to do a little bit more as well within our school community um, and have organized um, some podcast sessions um, one of our facilitators um, got a group of staff together. We all kind of listened to a podcast um, uh, under the DEI umbrella and were able to reflect with one another um, and think about how we can put some of this work that we're doing into practice um, and also reflecting, you know, as individuals as well. If we can reflect as individuals, we can make that positive impact um, on kids. Um, the level of teacher and staff collaboration through this initiative has been wonderful. Uh, they've really um, not only um, enjoyed the district-wide PD, they've been talking about how to infuse some of the things that they've learned in, into practice. And it's been great as a school to be able to spend some time uh, with our school community as well um, through those podcast sessions. We hope to have one more in the spring. Um, for our student grade level meetings, we're also trying to tie in um, some of these topics that we're learning for students in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, so we're, hope, we're hoping to take what we're learning and apply it uh, for our students. Um, on this next slide, uh, Beth Matthews, a fourth grade teacher um, at South Road, talks a little bit about um, DEI from her lens um, and uh, what she's gotten out of some of the initiatives. Hi, I'm Beth Matthews, and I teach fourth grade at South Row School. As teachers, we are always striving to improve our craft as well as continue to grow as individuals. This year, we've been focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusivity, also known as DEI in our classrooms. During many of our PD sessions this year, we have partnered with IDEAS, which has delivered some incredible training, as well as spark thoughtful discussions focusing on DEI. In addition, many of us had the opportunity to participate in a podcast discussion around being a better ally. We engaged in a discussion on how we can be part of the solution for creating a more inclusive culture, both inside and outside our classrooms. We are looking forward to our continued training and group <coughs> discussions that focus on DEI as we grow both personally and professionally.
So a special thank you to Mrs. Matthews. She actually took on the leadership um, organization of putting together that podcast session and a big thank you to our SEL team for all the work that they're doing. Um, as a school community, we've also had some reading and math challenges happening for our students at South Row. Um, in the fall, we had a very colorful hallway of different colored leaves um, as we built a tree um, of reading minutes. So uh, students were encouraged to read at home. Um, and as a school, we competed to see which grade level could get the most reading, uh, most time on reading. Um, and each color represented a grade level. And right now we have a blizzard, quite literally, but a blizzard of math facts uh, in our lobby. Um, and this has given students the opportunity to practice math facts at home. Um, so again, really trying to build that partnership with home, but also kind of rebuilding on some of the concepts that we're teaching uh, throughout the day. So focusing on those foundational skills. Um, and there's nothing better than a little friendly competition amongst the grade levels. So we hope to announce our winning um, math fact challenge grade level, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And the kids just love to see it upon coming into school um, and really are also developing a sense of seeing how the colors look, how their grade's doing. So it sparks some curiosity as well. Um, Mrs. Bullock, uh, one of our first grade teachers, was really um, beh uh, behind a lot of the organization to these challenges and had approached Mrs. Gilbert about uh, putting it together. So a big shout out uh, to Kara Bullock. And um, she talked a little bit about um, the challenges and her students also share a little bit about uh, what they've enjoyed about it. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me for the spotlight on South Row. I am Mrs. Bullock, a first grade teacher here at South Row, and I'm excited to share with you a little bit about our initiative school-wide for some fun challenges the students have been working on with their families at home. Every year, I like to come up with something a little bit extra to engage and encourage the students to practice a little bit more at home. And given that the last couple of years with the pandemic, I knew that all of our students really need a little something extra and many of the students love a good old challenge so i thought why not involve the whole school and we could have a fun little competition between all the grade levels to see who could read the most minutes this october so i brought the idea up to mrs gilbert and after that we had a lot of staff and student buy-in our amazing mrs c was able to create a beautiful tree for our bulletin board for our leaves to be falling from our amazing office staff made leaves that they kept us fully stocked in and they helped to count and tally all of those leaves. So every week in our school link, we were able to know which grade so far was in the lead and how close were we. So first grade was really trying to jump up on the top of that competition. And I'm just really proud of the South Road community for all of their dedication. They actually read over 57,000 minutes just in October for that reading challenge. So I'd like to share with you the bulletin board that we had started together. So this amazing bulletin board, our beautiful tree falling into reading and the kids did an amazing job. The families did an amazing job. I actually have a few students in my class who wanted to volunteer to share a little something about the challenges that we've been doing. I'm Ava. I like the reading challenge because I challenge my family. We also shook it up a bit and decided for the month of January that we were going to be practicing some math facts. So for this month so far, we practiced in just three weeks, almost 10,000 minutes of math facts. So we are creating a blizzard of math facts here at South Row. I love to win but for the math challenge because it's so much fun. Hi, I am Liam. And I like the math challenge because it's a challenge and I love challenges. I am just really proud to be a member of this amazing supportive community that is filled with families, staff, students that all are willing to encourage each other to just continue to reach for the stars. So thank you again for having me on the spotlight this month. I'm really excited to share for South Row and I hope you enjoy hearing a little bit more about some special things about South Row. See, everybody loves a good challenge, right? <laughs> um, and a special thank you again to Mrs. Bullock. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she really took the lead on this. And I think our teachers, uh, we all have a lot on our plates, but to just to be willing to take a little bit extra to get our whole community involved, um, I, we really appreciate it. Um, as you all know, South Row is a very special place. 
Um, it's a very special school, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that make it a little bit more, a little bit special. Um, one piece is we do a monthly kind act uh, every month. So we try to focus on something uh, that's kind, whether it's for our community um, and or beyond. Um, so this month, uh, sorry, throughout the year, we've started um, our September with a Say Hello Week, uh, which focuses on um, really just being inclusive um, and welcoming to all members of our community. Um, we did a coach drive for Anton's Cleaners here in town. Um, we did our Veterans Day writing where we wrote to veterans um, at the VA hospital in Bedford. Um, our fourth grade team takes on that kind of um, kind act. Um, so a big thank you to Mrs. Duncan for bringing uh, those letters down there for us. Um, we also did a Treats for Troop initiative uh, right around um, October, the October months um, to provide troops from Sweet Treats. Um, we had a PJ donation uh, for the Wish Project, which is a, which is a partnership uh, that we've been working with there um, based out of Lowell uh, for the last couple of years. Um, last week, we had our Great Kindness Challenge um, at South Row, which really focuses on spreading kindness uh, throughout our school community. Um, and students are looking forward to writing Valentine's Day cards as well this month. Uh, I mentioned uh, we had we have been working with the Wish Project um, for the last couple of years, and a South Road parent um, who also works for the Wish Project, so it's been a great collaborative effort. Um, we've donated lots of PJs, socks, underwear. Um, it supports also children not only in our surrounding community, but we also use some of these donations for our own school community first, uh, which is uh, wonderful to be able to have things on site to support families. And it's just been a great partnership. So Crystal is going to talk a little bit about um, the work that the WISH Project does. So grateful for our partnerships with schools such as South Row Elementary because not only do the schools bring in huge collections of things that we most need, they also are introducing hundreds of students to the importance of giving back. And also they're raising the awareness of our services to families in the schools who may benefit from them. Together with schools like South Road, we're building a better community. So we look forward to this uh, partnership. And as you can see with some of the kind acts that we highlighted, some of them involve like a donation or might involve uh, whether it's a money donation or an actual tangible donation, but some don't, right? Uh, Valentine's Day card letters are just something positive and kind to do. Um, so we try to balance um, when we're thinking about our kind acts through the years uh, to make sure that they're inclusive, that all students can feel like they're taking part of. We also um, have monthly spirit days. Uh, we have a each month we have one Kindness Matters Day where students are encouraged to wear kind shirts or do something kind. We have a Chumsford South Row Spirit Day and we also have like a special school spirit day which our student council has been helpful uh, getting involved in. Um, it really is a community builder. It brings us all together. Um, our kids get very excited for um, these spirit days. We try to highlight um, pictures through a monthly video um, and it really just uh, creates that just excitement amongst the school community. Some other things that make South Road really just truly a special place um, is just the partnerships that we have with our amazing PTO, our school council, and the subcommittee meetings um, that we have for a variety of different initiatives within our school. Um, right now, we're um, getting ready to host our virtual science fair, which our school, school council runs. Um, this is always a beloved South Row event uh, where students really get into making um, and following like a science passion. Um, and we look forward, although it's virtual, to have at some point later on in the year, students have the opportunity to bring their projects in uh, for our school community to see. Uh, we're really excited to be bringing back our international festival uh, this year after a couple of years off. Um, this group has already started the planning um, and uh, we've de definitely trying to expand on the international festival with our DEI lens. Uh, we're partnering with the high school, uh, the Melting Pot Club, um, uh, also, one of our foreign language teachers, uh, Mr. Mulrooney, is a, a parent at South Row, and he's also getting involved in this committee. So we're hoping to grow our international festival um, to just create more community partners. I think Donna had mentioned about Irish step dancing that we hope to add in as well. So we'll definitely pass that date on to you all. We'd love um, to see you at the event. We have a courtyard uh, partnering group. Um, as well uh, at our pumpkin fair and it's just our staff is really just committed to do whatever it takes for students um, and we couldn't thank them enough. Um, I think the biggest thing that makes South Road special is just that mutual respect uh, between students, staff, um, and families. Uh, so it just in summary, our goals um, is to just continue to proactively seek partnerships. Mm -hmm. We're very open to feedback on how we can continue to grow and just make a positive impact uh, within our community and at large. So any partnerships that we can continue to have um, has been kind of our focus in looking into this year. 
as Mrs. Gilbert said, we both share just the relationships with families and relationships in general are so, so important uh, now more than ever. Uh, to continue to work collaboratively uh, for students and create student leaders um, is something that we're looking to continue and ex to expand on. Um, and as you can see from the presentation tonight, um, or hopefully you can see students, staff, families coming together uh, for the common goal, um, our school community, um, and taking on leadership roles um, just on their own, uh, which is just wonderful to see. Um, so we look forward to continuing to partnering with teachers and just our whole community um, and recognizing the leadership and our whole staff. So we hope you enjoyed um, us bringing our partners to you um, because it's better than just us talking about them. Um, so we hope you liked all the videos. Um, and one other partnership I just wanted to mention was um, I feel so fortunate to have a partnership with Jason. Um, he has made my transition into South Row um, amazing and wonderful. Um, and he is unbelievable to work with. Um, and it has helped me become, feel, feel like I'm a part of the community, like right from the get-go. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, and if anybody has any questions or comments, um, we'd love to hear them. Any questions? No. no. Uh, as a liaison to South Row, I can attest to all the hard work that Mrs. Gilbert, Mr. Ramal, and all of the staff at uh, South Row, as well as the families, <clears throat> and they put in to making it a very special community. It's very evident when you walk in or participate in any of the events, uh, PTO meetings included, uh, that it's a, a very hardworking, invested community. Any other gentlemen? I just want to make a comment. I'm more than willing to give high fives on Fridays. I would doubt that I'm as cool as a police officer or a firefighter, but I'll do it. <laughs> I'd love okay. to have you. Um, Personally, I really enjoyed seeing the collaboration among all your different partners. Um, it's really amazing to see. It's great to see that it's staff, it's community, it's administration, it's students, and I love to see the leadership developing in the among the students. That's absolutely wonderful. So good job with all of this, and um, I'm glad you're having a good first year. Thank Mr. Romilo was very nice and welcoming, always. Thank you, Maria. Yep. John, I'll join you for that high five, <laughs> and maybe <laughs> together we can raise our level to a little higher. A little bit higher. A little higher. <laughs> well, you bring it up, 70%. So good. <laughs> All right, anything else? Well, thank you very much for coming thank in. Thanks for all the hard work you've been doing, and uh, keep it up. Thank you. Great, great. It's it's clear just from hearing from Terry and Jason that um, you know there's a lot of good stuff happening at South Row and they're very enthused with the partnerships. So we very much appreciate you coming tonight and sharing a little bit about the work you're doing there. Um, very much appreciated. And I like the kids uh, in the videos too. That was nice. We had a little bit of trouble last year. Terry, you weren't here for this. I, oh, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> had a little bit of technical difficulties, but uh -huh. I have to say. Tonight couldn't have gone off smoother, and I'm wondering if it has something to do with the fact that Linda is running the computer as opposed to myself. Thank you, uh -huh. Linda. Well, yeah. <clears throat> it, it seems to have worked. So thank you guys very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank thank have a good night. Thank you. Great. Um, second up this evening, we're going to ask um, uh, Brad Dorn and Michelle Rogers from uh, Dorn Whittier here. If you recall, I think it was two meetings ago um, that Brad and Michelle and actually Jason were here. We talked a little bit about the, um, the options as far as how we're going to move forward with our uh, capital planning. We talked a little bit about our um, statement of interest to the MSBA for a um, new school uh, project down the line. We um, had been applying for the last several years for kind of a high school-based project, and we had the discussion and kind of reached consensus and agreement about um, maybe shifting that focus and moving forward with the middle school project. Um, so that kind of came out of the discussion that night. And then um, there was a question a little bit about, you know, we have to have one school kind of lead the application. So should it be McCarthy? Should it be Parker? Um, and we had that data. And we, we actually asked um, so that we could all be here as a group to talk about it for them to come back and share that with us. Um, so Michelle and Brad have actually um, kind of prepared a document that just parallels the two schools and some of the challenges with regard to um, updating that's necessary and whatnot. So they're here tonight to kind of walk us through that. And my, uh, my personal goal by the end of the conversation tonight would be to get some direction on which school we should actually uh, work on. 
because I'll then start to craft the uh, statement of interest, which will be due into the MSB, um, I'm sorry, MSPA in the April time frame. So I will turn it over to uh, Michelle and Brad. Thank you for coming back again tonight. Well, thanks for having us. I'm, I'm sorry we weren't here the last time, but as you can see, there's two of us tonight. There was three of us last time with Jason, and, and the last time we were scheduled to come, Jason's family ended up getting COVID. But he was, he went, we shipped him off to a hotel. He was fine for a while, <clears throat> and everybody got better. And then he got COVID. Oh. <clears throat> so he's still kind of, we're, we're kind of keeping him away from everybody right now. So we just thought it would be better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so hopefully we'll all collectively get work through this somewhere down the road. But yeah, we have a little presentation that where we can do a, a kind of a, a look back a little bit at, you know, some of the, the other options that we looked at and, and compare the two schools. So that'll just turn it over to Michelle. And hopefully we're going to be in sync here. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the, the agenda pretty much stays with what Jay just said. You had asked us to do this comparison between the two schools um, and look at uh, the facility needs between the Parker and the McCarthy so that you can help uh, determine your priority school. Oh, sorry. So uh, we start with um, going back to 2016 with this chart that we had put together when we had done our original master plan. This was our facility assessment of all of the schools in the district. And you can read across the top there is the, the name of the school and going down the side are the 12 areas where we did our assessments. So and this chart in one quick glimpse can uh, help you determine where you need the most focus. Um, I think you can see that fire protection is needed through almost every school except center. Or you could go from the top to the bottom and see specifically what's needed in each category for each school. The, in the center of the um, chart there is the McCarthy and the Parker School. McCarthy's on the left and Parker's on the right, if you can't see that. And if you're going down the chart, you can see that they're pretty close um, comparison from this 30,000 foot uh, level. You know, they're both doing okay or fair in many categories. Their structural systems are in good condition. Um, when we start talking about mechanical systems, you'll see a difference there where when we did our 2016 assessment, um, Parker had received new boilers and you were doing some upgrades on your unit ventilators. So those things got you know, an extra good, um, but there were still some pieces of those distribution, um, things like piping and venting and, and things that take you from the boilers to the actual units. They were still old, they remain old, and as we go through time, they're getting even harder to fix and more costly. Um, there, many of them are reaching the end of their um, usable or fixable life. So as time goes on, those kinds of elements get more expensive. Um, moving further down the, the line here, you can see when we get down to ADA, oh, where is it? Up. Oh, um, okay, so, so this one is showing ADA as they're both being equal. but. But they're really not. The Parker School is actually in poor condition, and the McCarthy School is in fair condition. And I'm going to touch on that in just a minute, um, what I mean by poor condition and accessibility. And when we get down to functional use of space, they're both in the yellow category, but there's a big difference between uh, the McCarthy yellow and the Parker yellow, which I'm going to also address in just a moment. So starting, both schools are similar in the year that they were built. I mean, six years apart isn't a great difference um, when you're talking about a year of a school. But you can see the difference in the structures. The Parker School is a three-story school, but it goes downward. So the, the main level is at the top, and then you go down uh, the extra two levels. And McCarthy is a two-story school. They're both uh, interior bearing uh, construction. And they both received um, upgrades and renovations in 2006. So comparatively speaking, they're, they should be in similar condition. But when we delve a little bit deeper into the capital improvements plans, the cost of making the capital improvement repairs that we had identified over a 10-year course for the Parker School were about $7 million more than those that we identified in the McCarthy School. And much of that cost is related to mechanical systems, and the difficulty to run the mechanical systems through the Parker School. The electrical systems, hazardous materials, there's more hazardous materials, and I'm, I'm going to be very clear. Just because they're called hazardous materials does not mean they are a hazard. So I just want to be very clear with that, and the public, um, this, the district does a fantastic job of um, removing any um, 
any hazardous materials that are in need of removal each year. Um, and ADA is a huge issue for the Parker School and would be quite costly to implement the changes necessary to bring it to code. And again, I think you'll see that in a few moments when I go through the floor plans. Since 2016, um, you have done a lot of work on both schools. Um, again, I, I credit this district in maintaining your buildings very well. You have done some upgrades to the, some of those capital improvements that we had identified, um, things like the kitchen area. You've, uh, you're working on your unit ventilators, bringing those up as best you can. You're working on your heating systems in both schools. Again, uh, the bottom line there says the ongoing removal of hazardous materials throughout uh, the district as well as these two schools. Um, you're upgrading your fire alarm systems. A lot of that work has been done in both of these schools. Go ahead. When we start thinking about the functional use of space, we talk about how many students can each building serve and how well are they serving them. And so when we start looking at classroom capa capacity, I know that Jason has walked you through this uh, a couple of times. When you talk about the classroom capacity, the McCarthy School without the modulars can serve 800 students. And the Parker School without the modulars can serve 572. And that's based on the number of classrooms. So when you think about McCarthy being quite large, it has extra space. It has an additional gym. It has a very large auditorium. It has a lecture space. Those aren't counted in that classroom count. So when we think about general classrooms, we're looking at really serving 800 students. In Parker, we don't have those extra big spaces, but we do have a large portion of this space that is the TV station area on the second floor. Um, so some of that spaces are taken off. So Parker is meeting its educational needs with additional modulars. Uh, McCarthy has a few as well. They have four, but um, Parker has more. And if you go to the right-hand side, you'll see that the classrooms at McCarthy, 67% of them are smaller than your MSBA guideline. And at Parker, 53% of them are. Now, these can be worked around by having smaller class, classroom sizes. So instead of 24 students, you might only put 20 students in a classroom. But at McCarthy, you have more classrooms. So you can actually still serve more students, making that a better option uh, for functional use of space. Go ahead. So I'm going to just start with the Parker School. So those of you who are not very familiar with it, um, it's, it's a rather complicated school. It's very interesting and beautiful in some ways. Um, the, the main level is at grade, and then you go down two floors. So you can see the main level entrance on the far right in that diamond. And go ahead, one click there. We'll show you where the lobby is. And another click will show you how you might circulate, circulate around the first floor. This gives you access to about 50% of the classrooms around that first floor. And it's very easy and to identify where you're going. Unless you have to go to band or OTPT and then give it a click. You have to walk all the way around there through the gym and around the back and all the way up to those two modulars in the far end. So pretty circuitous. Um, from this main lobby, you actually do have a set of main stairs and an elevator. Go ahead with a click. And that will take you down to the second or the first lower level. And you land here. But unfortunately, you only get to four classrooms from this spot. If you want to go to classrooms, that are not one, three, four, the, that first row, you would have to travel through other classrooms. So that makes it very difficult um, for scheduling classes. You have to have all students moving at the same time so that you can efficiently move students around this building. If your class is on the second lower level, the only way to get there is from those middle sets of stairs unless you're going through classroom, other classrooms. Very, very difficult. If your classroom is room 116 and you need to travel between classrooms um, for, let's say you have to go to the bathroom, go ahead and give that a click. That's located up there on the first floor. One more click will show you where the other ones are. 
So if I'm down on the second lower level and I need to go up there to go to the restroom, I have to, and it's middle class, I have to go up three flights of stairs and around the corner and find my way to the bathroom and all the way back. It's a very long way to travel. Needless to say, if you were to bring this up to ADA standards, you would have to have four elevators installed, or three additional elevators installed in this building. There might even be a requirement to have a fourth because the, the walkway is exterior. So the other, the other way to come across that would be to enclose that exterior walkway on the first, on the first lower level and then reduce the elevators. Very invasive work, to say the least. Um, go ahead and forward. I'm going to show you a few pictures here of the Parker School. So on the f top left is the first main staircase that brings you down to the first lower level. Um, adjacent to it is the staircase that's on that second lower level. And if you were to go from one end of that hallway to the other, you would have to go around this staircase. You can see the door on the other side. There's not enough headroom under the staircase for even a small person like me. Um, so you have to go all the way around the stair, the staircase uh, on that lower level. The picture to the right of that is an exterior elevator, which is great because it allows students to use the exterior courtyard. This is accessible from the first lower level and could bring you down to that courtyard. And then therefore students could use that. But again, they would have to uh, approach this courtyard in a very different manner than any of their colleagues, their peers. Um, your corridors are wide, which is a plus. Uh, you can see in the bottom row there on the far left is a typical classroom with exposed ceilings. Uh, adjacent to it is a, 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 trans, uh, a teaching space. It used to be like a um, back of house kind of space. It's been turned into a small office and teaching space. Um, the middle or the third one from the right is the cafeteria and auditorium. And then next to that is the music room, which is one of those rooms on the second lowest level, which is only accessible through that set of stairs. I think this room used to be a um, industrial arts room of some sort. Go ahead and go forward. Uh, top left is a typical science classroom. And in the middle on the top is your gymnasium. And you can see, I'm going to show you a gymnasium of the McCarthy School so you can see the difference between the two gyms. And adjacent to that is the health room, um, which is located in one of the pods. The lower two um, on the left is, the again, the cafeteria and the, the um, music area and auditorium. And it's used for um, music classrooms uh, as well as um, a stage area. And then finally, to the right is the um, limited uh, seating area for the gymnasium. So that's Parker School. Go ahead. Um, McCarthy School, again, we're going to uh, start with the main entrance there and your main lobby. Go ahead. And you can see here, this is a very simple floor plan. It's a square with one wing. And go ahead. The only, dis the only drawback on this plan is that if you do have um, either a foreign language or health class, they're way out there in, in uh, those four module classrooms at the end. It's a long way to walk, but it's a straight uh, way, which is different than the OTPT and the band of the Parker School. Um, if you were to go to the second floor, which is visible from uh, this main entrance area and that staircase, go ahead. And it brings you right up to the second floor. Go ahead. And you can see that that's a very simple uh, travel distance. And so it's easy to find your way around this school despite how large it is, which I think is very important when you start talking about kids learning their way around um, a larger school. Um, in this school, if you do need to use the restroom, go ahead. Or what, There's your stairs all the way around, so you're connecting stairs. And if you need to use your restroom, they are located in the academic wings on both floors. So it's very convenient to the students um, should they need to, to use the restroom during classes. Go ahead. The Time's over. <laughs> so here in the, the McCarthy School, you're going to see that front staircase. Um, you do have some ADA issues, as I did allude to before with the McCarthy School. You can see the ramp here is a little bit steep, the wooden ramp. 
The wider ramp doesn't have any um, handrails on it. And the staircase and that entrance, um, you can see the staircase behind that brick wall is a, a lift. So if you were to enter that um, side door, you would get yourself into the little lift and go down those extra three steps. These, are, they're not the best ADA solutions, but they are good solutions for the time. And um, things like handrails would be easier to um, install than elevators, and ramps are easier to fix than elevators. So in this way, even though they, this school does have its needs, the, the cost of repair or um, bringing these up to code would be much less expensive than the Parker School. Oh, sorry, go back one more for me. Thank you. Um, here you'll see that there's a general classroom. You can see the acoustical ceiling tiles in these classrooms that you didn't see at Parker. <coughs> On the, uh, in the middle here, you see the cafeteria, which is only a cafeteria. And on the far right-hand side, you see the small lecture hall. The lecture hall does have some ADA issues. You can enter at the top and sit at the back of this, um, but you cannot get to the bottom part of that. But it's still um, a, a much better situation than some of the other areas that we've talked about. Go ahead. Um, here you'll see the gymnasium on the top, and right below that is that auxiliary gym. It's a very different environment than having um, health bicycles in the pod. And then you see the, uh, the auditorium, which on our most recent visit has been upgraded um, and has received a lot of upgrades, including ADA upgrades for things like the control booths and seating. So that is the comparison between the two schools and um, why we, we think that we're leaning towards the Parker as the priority, but we know that that is really your decision based on those plans. Okay. You want to have any questions? Yes, my, my question would be, would having the um, ADA issues and the unusual setup um, be something that, that MSBA would look at as part of the, the whole process of deciding whether this is a project they want to put forward? I mean, besides just general structural things, are these things that they would consider? As part of your, when you're filling out the, yeah. yes, absolutely. Okay. It, okay. Um, it, we talk about ADA as if everybody's in a wheelchair, but we also know that there's the student that went and broke, went skiing and broke his leg and now, you know, can't walk three flights of stairs. Even though that's a temporary situation, it is harder to move that student around from class to class than it is to make special arrangements for somebody who might have um, other permanent, more permanent physical conditions where you could move their classrooms. Um, here, this is, you're affecting a student's um, daily schedule. Okay. Other questions? Okay. I, I, think it's, I think my question is premature, um, but you know, as we're talking about, uh, you know, putting Parker as possibly uh, forward as the school that we would like to see replaced. Given all of the things that are wrong with Parker, does that mean that we would have no uh, uh, viable future use for us in the district? The Parker? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for the time being, whether it were Parker or McCarthy, the buildings are going to be used until there was a new building solution for no, us. No, I get that, yeah. Um, but then, no, I mean, I anticipate if we were to designate Parker as the school, if we then um, get accepted into an MSBA process and we work with them and there's a solution to build a new school mm -hmm. that's when we would have to talk about again is it like that kind of mega middle school is it um, a different grade level configuration and it's kind of half the middle school um, but if Parker is the school then eventually in my opinion that would be coming offline okay so then that wouldn't be used and that was a little bit of the issue we were running into with the high school mm -hmm. where we were trying to say was um, we were trying to make a case that the high school should we needed a new high school but then we were saying that well but we're gonna go reuse that building um, so maybe it didn't raise to the level we needed a, a new building project. Um, so I think in our discussions, um, probably over the last couple of months, I've come to the fact that once we actually get, say, a new middle school, uh, one of the two is going to have to come offline, okay. one of the buildings. So right. we're saying that Parker would be the one to come offline right. um, because of the costs associated with bringing it up to speed. Right, exactly. That's kind of what I was getting at is if this is something that, you know, once we go through the feasibility study and all of these things, if we determine... Uh, you know, that uh, Parker is going to be the school. Will it have some uh, purpose for us in the future after a new middle school is built? But it doesn't sound like it's a really viable option. 
I don't think it's a real viable option. I think that would, again, other people can jump in. I think that would hurt our argument as far as needing a new school. Right. If we say we then we need a new school, but we could still use that school. Um, I think what we would try to do with a new middle school project is basically um, somehow help our elementary population by, again, if you had that bigger school that was all containing, you could repurpose McCarthy right. as your, like, a fifth elementary school. Or if you built, um, say, a, a, a three-grade school, then you could basically take, say, the fourth grade out of the elementary and move it up into another school. So I don't see Parker being a viable building for anything, like, once there were a new project. Mm -hmm. um, that would basically be coming offline to, to have there be a new project. Right. Thank you. Just, um, go ahead. just a weird question. So the TV studio, which is, you know, it's a city asset. I mean, yeah. do we have a requirement with the town to support that if we go to another building or will we have to move this studio? What, what happens with that? I don't know that we necessarily have a requirement, but I think we'd want to. Yeah. And, like, I would see, because uh, that's kind of a valuable piece of our yeah. operation and programming. Yep. So we probably want to build that into a new facility. Okay. Um, like we have a TV studio at the high school um, now, and we have the special studio at uh, Parker. But if we were to do a new uh, building, we might want to actually carve out a new space for the studio to move with us. Got it. Well, maybe at that point in time, if McCarthy stayed, we'd say we're going to repurpose some space in McCarthy and move the TV studio there. We'd have to work with Telemedia on it. I wouldn't necessarily want it to go away, but it might just have to move to a different school. All right, so for the telemedia guys, I have your back. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we all appreciate the partnership. So it, it wouldn't be something we want to move on from. And I think it's part of the process, right? All of those, you know, kind of will start to work themselves out as you start to go through the process because the MSBA process is going to require that you look at, you know, whatever, whatever school you come in, you know, get in under. They're going to ask for a renovation, Right, they're going to ask for a renovation addition. They're going to ask for you know new construction. So you see the whole gamut of what what is available for you. So if there is a repurposing option, you know that'll come out through that process. It may may or may not. So I think right now what you're trying to do is is find a project that's you know has a, a you know the best case for you to get into the program. And then you can also once if you know if you get through there, then you can start talking to them about you know different types of you know enrollment projections and maybe as you're saying, Jay, right, kind of like looking at combinations there. But key is to get your nose under the tent first, and and you know as we've discussed previously, th this may be a a more fruitful path than than what we've experienced so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments? I, I think I think I got it already that configurations is not something we really have to decide on right now. We just have to decide on which building. And um, this made it pretty clear, I think. Right. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, <clears throat> anybody have any um, reason why they would want to do something other than Parker? Yeah. Um, no, it makes the most sense. That makes the most sense. Yeah. Do we need to take a formal vote for you to be able to? Um, I think, I mean, directionally, I think everyone agrees that Parker would be the school to put into the application. You'll take a vote when I actually put the statement of interest application together, um, and it will specify that Parker is the priority school. So that's when you're technically taking the vote. Okay. Um, I will now shift to be doing everything and writing it up as if Parker is the school. So should anything change in your mind between now and the next two months, okay. you got to let me know because I'm going to be very Parker-focused. But I get the sense that we all agree Parker is the way to go. So I'll just prepare the application that way. And then ultimately when you vote uh, the statement of interest, that's when um, – you're kind of voting to support that. So everybody's good with that? Everybody's on board with mm -hmm. we do it to Parker as a, an alternative? And it looks like this they would have a much better chance of getting through the MSBA process than obviously than the high school, but even McCarthy. So <coughs> I, I think that's I think that's right, right? Because the, the key part here, what we were talking about before when you made it, it was, you know, we we're talking about tipping the dominoes, right? Yeah. And you know, all these other things were gonna be beneficial, but it wasn't as evident that the high school was the most needy project within the district yeah. or as compared to other districts. Here, I think you're making a better case, right, for what that entry vehicle is into the process. And then at that point, you know, you can start to maybe see what, what type of wiggle room you have. 
All right. Well, thank you very much and for you. that information you. and uh, all thank your you. hard work. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of the night. See you later. You too. Stay thank healthy. You. Take care. Thank you, Linda. Bye, Sarah. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Good night. Good night. You passed. So we're going to um, thank Michelle and Brad for uh, for doing that. I'll connect with thank you guys. later in the week. Um, we're going to shift a little bit now into the uh, recommended budget for fiscal 23. So we'll just take a second to get set up for that. So for those um, watching at home, we do not include a copy of the recommended budget in the packet that's posted online right now until we do the presentation tonight. Uh, so tomorrow morning, that'll be uploaded to the uh, the website so people can access the uh, document. But what I'm going to do is actually just walk you through the document itself, some of the recommendations that I've incorporated into the document. And then process-wise, um, we actually will have a formal budget hearing the first week in March. Um, so the school committee is really for the first time receiving and going to be hearing this document tonight. You have about a month to review it, um, to solicit input and questions and comments and whatnot. And then our first meeting in March is typically when we'll have our budget hearing. So we'll actually post for that. Um, just process-wise again, I'll actually email a copy of the budget to all the town meeting reps so that they can uh, review it and ask questions or reach out to you if they have any um, concerns or input that they'd like to give. And then after we do our budget hearing in March, um, I'll work again with the town manager as town meeting approaches in April. Um, sometimes, well, I assume this year, we'll try to do a pre-town meeting. And I'll try to be a part of that to answer any questions that town meeting reps may have uh, about the budget. But a couple of practical matters. Um, we've kept the same format that we've kind of grown to develop over the years. Um, again, it's been very well received by um, staff and families and community members uh, as far as its readability and its uh, use. So the first section of the budget is really the narrative that we'll review tonight. It encompasses some of the um, underlying elements of the budget that I've incorporated in for planning purposes. Um, it then shifts into the uh, overall system-wide budget. You have individual uh, line items uh, within the budget. So ultimately, when we meet on um, March 1st to review the budget, we'll start on page 11 and actually go through page by page, answer any questions you may have, uh, talk about how we're spending our money, because this is a very big, um, important uh, element of the school committee and the administration's work. All of the individual pages from page 11 through the end of the budget document, which are called the category level detail, they feed up to the summary level total on page 10. So ultimately, uh, when we get to page 10, you'll see that the fiscal 23 budget um, is adding up to $67.5 million. And that's a $2.5 million increase over last year. And that's a number that I've worked with the town manager on. Uh, the town manager did his budget presentation last evening and he recommended a $2.5 million increase for the schools. Um, that's in line with what um, I was recommending that we actually uh, put forward. So our budgets are aligned. Um, and as we go through the individual pages, let's say you were to make a change, um, $1,000 or $1 million, you know, however it were reflected, it would ultimately um, carry up to page 10. And then when you take the bottom line vote on page 10, totaling, I assume, the $67.5 million, um, we have flexibility within those different lines, right? So if you uh, move something, uh, that would then uh, give us kind of our spending ability. We have to go to those macro level account, uh, accounts that are listed on page 10. If we want to transfer, say, one page to another page, that's when Joanna would write up a transfer. It would come before you for um, approval. Uh, that's how we typically have operated our budget, and it's worked um, well for us. At the end of the, um, the regular budget, we have what's called the staff salary book. So that's uh, every position that's listed in the personnel section of the budget that crosswalks up to the main document. So you can literally go page by page and verify the FTEs and the dollar amounts um, that correspond with that. And then at the very end of the document, we have uh, four appendices this year. Uh, the first one is on page uh, 62. That's our student enrollment. That's our latest enrollment uh, figures. Um, K to 12 in the district. That's a report that I presented to you back in um, December. The data hasn't changed for the current year as of that time. And I also included the NESDEC um, enrollment projection that they had done for us. Again, in case the viewing audience wanted to, um, to look at that. 
The um, second appendix we have, uh, B, is on page 91. And that's a listing of all of our different uh, clubs and activities, which clubs and activities our students have to uh, pay for, which have a fee, which don't have a fee. Um, that is on that page of the budget document. Appendix C on page 94 is our grant level um, summary. So Joanna has prepared an individual um, listing of all of our different grants, the dollar amounts that we receive for it, what the intended purpose of those funds are. That is separate from the local operating budget. So that's in addition to the 67.5 million that you'll actually uh, be reviewing over this next month uh, and approving. And then lastly, Appendix D on page 98 is just a listing of all of the different revolving and uh, other fund summary documents in the uh, school department. So those are the, uh, the line items that Joanna presents on. We have a monthly report, but then we do a quarterly update for you. Those are all the same accounts, but it just is all in one location for you to show you uh, where we're currently at, what we're projecting for the end of the year. Uh, and again, these are common appendices that we've had in the document um, that have been well, well received. So we kept that format going. So for your purposes, if we go back to page one and the, uh, the budget narrative that we'll kind of walk through tonight, I did some of these slides when we had Triboard back in December, so I'm just going to um, kind of um, move relatively quickly uh, through them. Um, with regard to our 22 budget, just before we get into 23, um, we're in very good shape on all of our accounts. I really have no concerns at all uh, in our fiscal 22 budget. We have contracts in place with all of our employee unions uh, through the end of this June. Uh, as you know, we're going to be starting negotiations with all of our unions uh, in the coming weeks. But um, our budget is solid uh, for this particular year because, again, we're locked into our um, spending based on the contracts. And as I mentioned, I have no concern over personnel or non-personnel uh, line items at this point in time. Um, we're actually on a very good trajectory. We're in the process of going through and actually determining what uh, some available extra resources in this budget may be for some one-time purchasing. And usually we'll do a projection for you over the course of the next couple of weeks. And then by March, we start talking about um, what are some ways we could reallocate uh, money from the fiscal 22 budget. Oftentimes we do some capital projects or some one-time spending that isn't going to affect our uh, carryover spending from year to year. Okay. Um, Again, these are just historically um, some of the areas that I have reviewed um, with you. If you recall, when we talked to Triboard and even like in press um, budget presentations, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, obviously want to look at comparable districts. So we have 10 comparable districts and they change on any given year. This gives us a, just a good sense of where our spending is at compared to districts across the state that are most common to us based on our total number of students, based on our demographic, um, our number of students who qualify for, say, free and reduced lunch, which is now termed economically disadvantaged, our number of students who um, have disabilities or maybe on an IEP, our number of um, ELL students. So across the whole state, these are the 10 most comparable districts for the current year. And again, every, every year you might drop two and add a couple, um, but this is our uh, grouping. So we always take a look at our different districts and try to figure out spending-wise. Um, most districts in the state, I believe there were only uh, 9 or 10 last year that actually spent less than net school spending. Uh, and over 300 districts spent, obviously, more than net school spending. So you always try to figure out how much in excess of the 100% net school spending are you at and where do you kind of fall among your comparable districts. So statewide, all school districts in the state the median was about 24, I'm sorry, 25.4 percent above net school spending. In Chelmsford, we actually exceeded that a little bit, 34.3 percent. And you'll see we're right about in the middle of the comparable districts as far as spending is concerned, on the low side of the, the middle. Um, that is, again, is a number, the top one. Burlington did end up being a comp for us this year. I'm going to be quite honest with you, Burlington is very difficult to have as a comp in here just because of their um, community uh, support base, the amount of business community there. What you're going to see is they spend far more than all the other comparable uh, districts when it comes to per pupil, when it comes to percent over net school spending, uh, even when it comes to, say, salaries and things like that. So Burlington is a little bit of an outlier. It, it does happen to be our comp this year, um, but that is one that, again, is on the, um, the other end of the spectrum. So when you say community support, you're actually talking about the commercial. It's the commercial tax base. So I just want to make sure that people understand. It's not 
support from the community. It's the commercial tax base that really helps them out. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just the amount of commercial tax base you have in that 128 belt, mm -hmm. and Burlington just happens to fall uh, right in it. But yes, they. It's not. I mean, their community supports their schools, but it's not sure. you know home income uh, right. that's uh, or income taxes, property taxes. Right. It's the res. Uh, it's the commercial tax base that's really kind of pumping money into the uh, system in Burlington. Um, so again, I think spending wise, we're in the low half of the of the middle, but I think that's been pretty consistent with where we've been over the last number of years. And again, we're a little bit higher than the state. On the next slide, we'll actually take a look at um, student teacher ratios. And again, this is something that we'll look at. Um, the telling point about this is obviously when you look at Chelmsford, this is for fiscal 21. You know, our average uh, student teacher ratio is 12.8 to 1. If you walk into most of our classrooms, you don't see 12 or 13 students sitting in the classroom. What this um, data point is actually helpful for is it just actually takes a look at all of your teachers you have uh, in the district divided by the number of students you have. Uh, and this is really just helpful. Again, doesn't help you in planning for classes because we don't have 12 or 13 kids in a class. But this just gives you a sense of total number of teachers you have in a district, total number of students. Where do you line up among your comparable districts? And again, we're right in the middle on this one. Um, so we've got about uh, five districts that have um, a little bit better uh, average teacher class size. Uh, I'm sorry, average uh, student teacher ratio. And we have five districts that have um, a higher student teacher ratio. Um, we end up having a slightly um, higher ratio than the state average. Um, but as far as our comps are concerned, we're right in the middle, which again, this is what I would expect um, given our historicals over the last number of years. <clears throat> Another data point that we look at, um, and this is one that obviously um, we pay attention to, is our average teacher salary. So of our comparable districts, we're actually dropping a little bit uh, here. Um, so we're really at the uh, bottom end, not by a significant amount because, you know, $500 or $1,000 actually kind of matters in this particular chart as you look at a grouping around the Westboro down to Melrose area where that would have an impact. But this is obviously something that we want to um, pay attention to. We want to make sure that we're paying our staff fairly. We want to make sure that we're attracting good staff to the district and we're retaining good staff. Um, so this is an element that we um, that we watch for and we're mindful of. Um, so this is an area where we have slipped a little bit. And you can actually see that we're about um, ballpark and $3,400, $3,500 less than the state average. Um, another point of comparison that people will always take a look at um, is how much money are we actually spending per pupil in the district for education? Now, again, this wouldn't be, you know, Jay's in a class and exactly 14620 is spent on him, but this is a sum of all the district's expenditures divided by the number of kids you have in a district. And this is important to, again, kind of gauge yourself within your 10 comparable districts to see where you're spending. So, again, we're right in the, the midsection of this particular grouping, which has been pretty consistent over the last number of years at the 14620 This is a couple thousand dollars less than the state average, and the state average is something we actually look at in this particular uh, case. Again, I just want to point to Burlington being the outlier. Again, I don't, I don't put a lot of credit or stake in that one just because of the um, dynamics in that community. Um, but we're in the ballpark of the others, and we're right in the middle of our comparable districts. So we're on par for that one. Um, this is <clears throat> So when we switch to kind of taking a look at, you know, uh, spending-wise, uh, where we're spending, I think, you know, historically, and this proves out again, you know, where we spend either in the, the median, kind of in the middle of our districts, or even on the lower end, but yet our performance really is at the top end of the spectrum when we take a look at our test scores. So this was our 2021 uh, fifth and eighth grade students who took uh, the um, science, next-gen science uh, standards. So you'll see we're um, up in the top third of districts here at 65% either meeting or exceeding expectations. Um, the next slide, we'll just run through these relatively quickly because I did do this at the, at the um, tri-board meeting. Um, so 10th grade obviously takes math and uh, ELA. This is the ELA score. Uh, and we only, we uh, were second from the top behind Westboro uh, with 81% of our 10th grade students scoring in the uh, meeting or exceeding category, which again is great. I always try to be in the top third of these, uh, of these groupings. Mathematics, the same thing at the high school. Uh, eight out of 10 of our students scored in the meeting or exceeding standards. We're number two for the top. We're right in the uh, in the band of the top third. 
Uh, and I guess that's the last comparison we have. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you got it. So those are just a couple of quick ones. Um, so again, from the community, when we, when we go to town meeting, we talk about this. Um, we do kind of hit on the fact that um, spending wise, we're right in the middle. You know, we're where we want to be, or even a little bit lower financially, but performance wise, and I think the town is really getting a good uh, bang for the buck when it comes to education and uh, the results that we get for our students in, in the district. So now we're going to shift a little bit to looking at the fiscal 23 budget, which we have a copy of before you tonight. And again, the um, as we were preparing this document throughout the course of the fall, I do work closely with the town uh, side, the town manager Cohen and the town departments to try to come up with a uh, revenue projection uh, for use. We take a look at what our actual costs would be as far as a kind of a level service budget. And then if we have to do some ads to the budget, what that would impact. Um, and the town manager has recommended a $2.5 million increase to the schools. Uh, and I have also asked for and incorporated that $2.5 million request into our budget. So that's what you have before you tonight. At the very bottom of this uh, chart, you'll just see a couple of the assumptions, and these are pretty consistent year over year. Um, but we have included um, any of the salaries within the budget uh, based on our current collective bargaining agreements. So we know we already have kind of a step and lane structure. So if uh, someone was to do a step increase, obviously we don't know what the new contract is going to be, but we've accounted for the step that they would be receiving under the old contract. So that's been taken into consideration. Um, if we know we have a teacher vacancy, obviously most teachers retire towards the top end of the teacher scale. When they retire, uh, we have historically budgeted a replacement teacher at master step three. So we've consistently uh, done that. We have a little bit of flexibility when we're attracting new teachers into the district. Uh, we do recoup that um, savings from the retiring teacher to the newer uh, teacher coming into the district, and that gets reallocated through our budget. Um, we actually thought we were going to have a few more retirements than um, we had thought because our teachers have the ability to kind of tell us ahead of time if they're going to retire for an early retirement incentive that we have. And then there's a date in January where they can notify us that they've decided to stay and they're not going to retire. So after that particular date, uh, we're down to just 12 teachers. Um, so 12 teachers is right kind of on par with what we would normally have in a year, uh, but we only have 12 retirements. So um, I think that's good from a recruiting standpoint because this market is still very difficult to be um, hiring uh, staff in. But uh, 12 is a very manageable number even considering what we've had uh, historically to try fill in the district. Um, so I'm feeling very confident about that. Did you have a question? Oh. Um, and then again, I just reiterated at the beginning part of the meeting, um, our contracts do end on June 30th, so we're going into negotiations now. Um, and I have put a set aside within the budget document that we typically have, a reserve for negotiations. So unlike the town departments, um, they actually don't have a line item within their budget. They uh, would settle a contract, the town manager would settle a contract, and then bring that to town meeting, and town meeting would increase the budget to pay for the contract. It's different within the school department because the school committee is really the bargaining group. Um, so you bargain a contract, but you need to have the money set aside in your budget to be able to pay for that contract. Um, so what I had done actually for the last number of years, whenever this has come up and we don't have a contract in place, I'll actually have a line item in the budget that we have a set aside for negotiations. So we kind of know what pool of, of funding that we're uh, dealing with. And so you'll see that incorporated into the budget this time as well for when we get into, into the contract, and we'll go through that. So our current budget for um, this year, again, takes into consideration all of the staff and programs and services that we currently have in the year right now as a base that rolls over into the following year, which we would call a level service budget. So we're going to be providing all of the same services that we're providing this year, next year, and the answer is yes. Obviously, we'll make some, um, some little tweaks and some little improvements as we go. Um, and then beyond that kind of base document, there are a couple of areas where I've earmarked uh, some additional funds for some programming and some additional staff to help us based on some of the needs that we have within the district that have been identified. So I'm going to walk you through those uh, today. So again, as you're reading your base document, um, assume it's a level service plus budget. Um, you're not going to see as you go page to page any uh, reductions. It's really these are things that I'm recommending the committee um, add to the budget. Um, I'm going to overview them tonight, and then obviously on March 1st when we have the budget hearing, um, some, several of them are actually special ed related, so I'll have available special ed staff to talk about the uh, items, um, some individual building principles, 
uh, may be here as well if they have a program or a service that's been identified for their budget to be able to discuss the impact that that may have on their school. Um, go ahead. So one of the big um, um, enhancements <coughs> that we have built into this particular budget um, is the inclusion or the launch of a middle school uh, language-based uh, program. So I want to step back for a second, and over the last, you know, four to five years, we have identified certain needs within the district, particularly within the realm of special education, where we've had to allocate some resources to build in-district programs to best serve our students so that we don't have to look at necessarily like an out-of-district placement if we can't provide the service that they have. So the most recent one I can think of is uh, at South Row School, where we did the elementary uh, Strive program. We built that program to really benefit all four elementary schools and any students that might be struggling and needing some type of a behavioral therapeutic program, they would stay in district and they would go to the Strive. So in this particular area, as kids are coming up through elementary school, we've obviously had a big focus on reading and literacy and dyslexia and trying to screen uh, students for any type of um, disabilities or uh, extra supports that they might need around uh, language and literacy uh, comprehension. Amy Reese and the Special Education Department have been talking for a little bit of time, and I know with um, CPAC and, and other members of the community as well, about wanting to launch our own language-based program, which we don't currently have uh, in the district. We think it makes sense uh, to do this and start it in fifth grade. Uh, this will be a multi-year uh, program, so this will be something very similar to, say, like a Strive that you're going to see be built into the budget uh, over the coming years. But this would actually be uh, started in fifth grade. So we would develop a program to be determined yet which middle school would house it because a specialty program like this would not be at both middle schools. Again, as an example, uh, McCarthy Middle School um, kind of houses our district's life skills program. Parker Middle School um, has an autism program. So one of the two middle schools would house the language-based program. And then any of our incoming fifth grade students who may be appropriate for this type of a program would go to that particular middle school and be part of this um, program and this additional service. Um, as these fifth graders move up to say sixth grade a year later we would have to add additional staffing to support that. Um, what this again I think is going to do and uh, as we really take a look at the data and the number of students who benefit from this um, is help us obviously best serve these students but also provide them with the opportunity to do that while remaining in Chelmsford in our schools as opposed to having a look to um, go to out of district placements if we can't provide the level of services that are necessary. Um, so this is a big programming um, enhancement. This is something that we have actually been looking at for a little bit of time, and I think we're ready, and we have a, a group of students who would really benefit from this to be able to launch this program. So you're going to see some staffing included within the budget, within the special, uh, special ed realm, to be able to launch and pilot and kick this program off. Uh, so that is the first um, programmatic piece within here. And I don't know, do you want to talk individually, um, program by program, or there's only a few of them. Do you want to go through them all and then come back and talk? Can anybody, why don't we do it one at a time? Because this is pretty big. Anybody have questions on this particular one? Mm -hmm. I haven't had a chance to review this thoroughly, so I don't know. So how m what's the staffing? <clears throat> what? and, I, and I honestly wouldn't expect you to have tonight because you just got this. Okay. So that's like what the next kind of month is, is like to be able to review this and some of the data behind this. So the staffing for the first year of the program is a dedicated special education teacher with some specific uh, skills. Highly likely they'd have like an Orton Gillingham uh, type background. They would have um, a high level um, kind of reading uh, background and two paraprofessional positions. So this is three additional uh, positions, a teacher and two paras for the fifth grade to get this off the ground. The program, and again, Amy and the special education staff can talk more specifically to this um, during the budget hearing when we're talking about it. Um, students would obviously be pulled out to receive some services by this uh, specialist group of staff, but we also need to pair them with um, an appropriate, and this is what we're going to be doing, is looking for the right pairing of um, general ed classroom teachers because the students would also obviously be part of a regular ed uh, classroom. So they'd be on a regular team in fifth grade, either at McCarthy or Parker. Again, that's what we're trying to figure out um, based on size and space and where the fit would be best. So they'd be on a team and they'd be supported by the special educator and paraprofessionals um, within the classroom at the same time being pulled out for some additional specific literacy reading supports. 
So uh, three positions in total. So this is very similar to having the reading specialists at um, the <clears throat> elementary level. No, we have the we have the reading specialists at the middle school level as well. This is really a specialized program for a specific group of students that would have um, a specific need for this intensity of um, reading services. And I have a lot of questions on this thing. So I'm, oh. I mean, I, we don't have to. Tonight, we, you're just, we tonight, you're just to taking it, tonight you're just taking it in. I'm just kind of reviewing with you what's in the document. Okay. And then when you're going to so read through I'll the document, back. you can come up with your questions. And when we actually have the budget hearing is when we'll um, kind of answer those okay. questions. And people, again, will be here to talk and, and to um, discuss them. I'm glad to see that this is finally taking off. Um, I would actually ask for uh, three teachers and six pairs. Uh, I, I mean, seriously, because at each you know, level, there's different needs. So um, I understand that it may take some time to roll out, but, you know, for kids that are struggling in class uh, with this particular type of uh, learning disability, you know, time was of the essence, right? right? Because it's not any fun to be in class or school and uh, if you are struggling with writing and reading and things like that where some appropriate intervention could make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. So I will be advocating for that. Um, yeah. yeah, and I see, again, this is, it's a launch, right? So right, this is right. like the start of a program that will build and develop. Yep. Um, and it also does have to kind of figure in and fit in with some of the other um, elements that we have right. when it comes to at the elementary grade levels, like the screener and the interventions. Um, the fact that we do have reading specialists and, you know, students may be going through the IEP process. Um, there are all different elements to it. But this is really a start, and uh, based on just the numbers, um, we think that the, the appropriate place to start this right now would be at the middle school going into the fifth grade for next year and build that program to the middle school. So but more discussion. Yep, yeah. and, I'm, and, I, and one thing I would, I was wondering, and I, you know, I understand it may be a little bit too soon, but just in terms of like a, um, uh, a skeleton plan mm -hmm. of, you know, what, what this might look like sure. um, and why, why it is that we're choosing the fifth grade and then what, you know, what subsequent years uh, will look like. Okay. That would be helpful. Good. These are this program would serve service students that might otherwise have to go to an outside placement. I mean, potentially, right, right, right. Okay, potentially, or you know, they. You hate to say it, they may just not have all of their services need uh, met properly, and I think that's what we're trying to do by this particular program here in the district. Correct. Okay, but there is a particular uh, element of student who would be very well served by this program and would potentially then be able to receive the services in Chelmsford as compared to having to go out to a, a different school to receive those services. And what you'll hear is a lot of parents, and I don't want to go down too far into this, but uh, you hear a lot of parents, you know, maybe pull their kids out and not seek an out-of-district placement, but place them in a private school, or they'll spend lots of money on tutoring um, to help their kids, um, you know, Orton-Gillingham tutors and things like that to help them stay up with, you know, um, their classmates and the material that's being presented in schools. So on the first, that's what Amy Reese will be here. She'll kind of be able to answer some of those questions that Donna. Yeah, correct. Before, I yeah. mean, like, so for the actual budget hearing, different people who are associated with the different recommendations mm -hmm. would be here to kind of get more in depth in it. I know like this, there's a whole consulting module mm -hmm. with this as well, where, you know, there'll be outside groups kind of working with us as we develop this program. And Amy will be able to speak to that. So I'm kind of giving just the high level what's been included mm -hmm. in the document tonight for you to um, you know, kind of wrap your head around a little bit, come up with some questions as we talk this through on the first. Great. 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 All right, the next element um, that we're looking at in the district is this is actually targeted at um, Chelmsford High School. Um, so this is two uh, specific uh, special education teacher positions that have been added in the budget. Um, the first one is with regard to the PAVE program. Um, so the PAVE program is our kind of life skills program, and we have a number of students moving up from the middle school this year to the high school, and the IEP and the caseloads just require an additional uh, special educator. We currently have one at the high school, and we really need to add a second to be able to be in compliance and to properly serve those students. So one of the positions is a specific special ed uh, position for the PAVE program. The other is the STEP program. So we have a number of students who um, transition back into the high school um, for a number of different reasons. And again, you're gonna see kind of a theme in some of these requests and some of these 
elements I put into the budget, we do have a number of students who are struggling, uh, particularly this year coming back into school, um, that are you know exhibiting uh, different behaviors and um, in need of different services that we typically have not had to um, deliver in Chelmsford, uh, and the need level is just very high. So in this particular STEP program, we currently have a counselor that kind of oversees the STEP program. It's a, um, intended to be like a short-term transitional program as kids come back to the high school and then and go back in. Kids have been staying a lot longer than, say, the 45 days during their transition. And what this is going to actually do is provide an academic special ed teacher to be working hand-in-hand -hand with that counselor to help the students as they come back into the, uh, the building. This is actually something that um, at our next meeting next Tuesday, Shannon Bischoff, uh, director of SEL, and uh, Katie Sims, our health coordinator, are gonna be here to present on. And this is actually something that uh, Shannon had recommended because she's been working very closely with the school and population and just some of the service level needs that these students are presenting with um, really would be best serviced with an additional adult support uh, and focused on academics in that particular classroom. Um, so these two special education teacher positions are included in the budget. Um, at our middle schools, again, um, service level needs are very high. Um, we have a number of students who are really needing extra supports as we're uh, coming back into uh, school full time. We currently have a model in both middle schools where we have a full time uh, school psychologist. Uh, Dr. Steve is at McCarthy, Dr. Sue is at Parker. And then two years ago, we hired a third um, to be split between the two schools to really do some of the testing uh, work that was done. So they've been half time between the two. Um, the caseloads, again, and just the service level needs of the, of the students have increased to such a point we need additional psycho, um, psychologist support in those two buildings. So the recommendation is actually to increase the half time psychologist up to full time. In essence, um, the full time individual we're employed now would basically move to one of the two schools and the other school would hire a full-time uh, psychologist. But it's to uh, increase the level of psychologist support in the two middle schools by uh, increasing that half-time to a full-time in those buildings. Um, so funding to support that has been included within uh, the budget for this year. Any questions on these two things before we? Well, this one and the next one that's coming, just a comment, is just, it's not, I mean, I know that we're talking about um, in the next one, the social workers, but in this one, uh, students on individual education uh, plans, but this would also help our students who are not on IEPs as they're trying to, you know, maybe they're struggling with issues or trying to reintegrate after yeah, a period of time. For both of these, it's really twofold. Right. Um, it's, there are certainly some IEP needs, right. but I'd add it on there. We just have increased service level needs. Um, of a number of students presenting at the middle schools and the high school level right. um, that our existing staffing level is just not um, fully able to support. Everyone is trying their absolute best. It's just the numbers and the caseloads, um, just given the number of needs that these students are presenting with, right. are significant. And I, I guess I was just wanting to make sure that I understood that this would be both for special education students and non-special education students. It can support both. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we go to the next slide? There's not too many more slides. <laughs> <coughs> oh, and the writing gets smaller here. Um, so on, this is really the last uh, kind of service level enhancement. Um, and to Donna's point, we were just talking a few seconds ago, and Shannon will, will discuss this next week when we're here as well. Um, we, again, are just seeing um, tremendous, tremendous social, emotional, mental health, um, counseling type needs from our students um, and our families within the uh, community. So one of the things that we're recommending, and we're kind of flushing through right now exactly what the supports would look like, um, would basically be three dedicated um, social worker, family uh, counselor type positions to help our families and our students, again, who are really struggling, uh, who are in need. Initially, what we're seeing here is actually, um, because again, the need is greatest at the upper level, the high school, you know, followed by middle and followed by elementary, likely having a dedicated, um, social worker type position to the high school uh, to again, to work with just the high high need student, helping them transition back into school, helping them access um, mental health counseling supports within the community. Our staff and our buildings that we currently have now again do a phenomenal job. They really do a fantastic job. Um, we need some additional supports also to be able to work with outside providers on case management of some of these students as they're coming back in uh, because they're highly involved. 
I then see a second position working uh, among our two middle schools, again, to help on that level, and a third to work with our elementary schools. Uh, and believe it or not, we actually have a number of, um, you know, elementary students, and we normally would not see this in a, a normal year, um, who are having some pretty significant and challenging um, mental health needs, um, counseling needs, and to be able to work with those students and families, um, to have them, again, reacclimate, reengage in school, um, I think these would be three kind of critical positions to help us as we're rebounding and getting back from um, COVID and back into full-time learning. Um, so those are the last, you know, actual staffing positions uh, that we have. And again, I know uh, next week, um, Shannon and Amy will be uh, kind of speaking to these and how they'd be used and the need level for them it is certainly there and it would be a welcome support for the schools. The, um, the last uh, or the middle item there is, uh, again, this isn't adding FTEs to the budget, but one of the areas that we've been kind of falling behind in a little bit is um, on our substitute rates. So our substitute day-to-day uh, -day subs, our long-term subs, our substitute nurses, um, communities around us. And again, this is a, a population um, that you would actually be kind of hiring locally. If we're gonna hire a teacher, it's not uncommon for a permanent staff member to come from two, three, four communities over. And again, you still need to be uh, competitive on the salary, but what's happening around us now in particular, and I don't see it going down, is when we're drawing in, say, like substitute teachers or substitute paras, they're really coming from the Merrimack Valley. So they're coming from Chelmsford and Methuen and Drake. And, you know, they're not coming from, um, you know, Burlington's and beyond. And our day-to-day -day sub rates, or all these other rates, have just uh, kind of dropped. So we really need to uh, change those. Again, doesn't add any FTEs to the budget, but within the uh, budget, you'll see what the recommendation is uh, for those to more in line with our local communities on our sub rates. Uh, and then the last bullet, uh, just kind of happy to report that uh, within this budget will be the fourth and final year of the one-on-one -on -one implementation. Um, so going into school next year, you know, every one of our fifth and every one of our ninth grade students will receive their new uh, district issued laptop, completely self-funded. You know, it does not come out of the local operating budget. Um, we use uh, the revolving fund uh, to be able to, um, uh, to pay for that. The school choice monies have been earmarked for that. Uh, and then going forward again, everyone five to 12 uh, has their Chelmsford issued device that they can keep for their four years. And uh, we're really just kind of happy that that program has now worked its way through the district and funding is included in the budget to be able to uh, to sustain that. Right, any questions right on these items? Okay. That's it. No, so f again, for your um, sake, as you read through this, and all of these are outlined a little bit more detail in the, uh, the budget narrative. Um, I will get this up online tomorrow so that, um, you know, staff and, and families in the community can kind of read through the level of detail that you have. Um, as you read through the document, if you have any individual questions whatsoever, if you want to, um, you know, shoot me an email, give me a ring. I'm happy to pull research together for you, pull data together for you, so that when we do meet on March 1st, it, it's a productive, you know, kind of budget review. We will go page by page uh, through the budget, answer questions, make any modifications uh, that you'd like. Um, I always look for your feedback, so if there's, you know, a way to present something uh, either differently or if you, um, you would like a little bit more data on something, you know, please let me know and we'll get that information out to you ahead of time so that you have everything you need as we're reviewing the, uh, the document itself. And as far as the general public, how can they comment? Um... So the general public, one of two ways. <clears throat> Again, it'll be posted tomorrow so people can access it. They certainly can email at any time. We do have a regular school committee meeting next Tuesday. Um, they certainly could um, either come make a public comment or they could email a comment that we could work on or read. Uh, and then the, public, the budget, I'm sorry, I can't speak yet, the budget hearing on March 1st is a public um, meeting. So anyone could come in and make a general comment about the budget. Um, people, when we go page by page through the budget, if someone wants to ask something about page 14, you know, they can come and actually say, you know, could you tell me about this or I'd like to recommend this. Um, so it's a totally public process. So they can do that uh, that evening as well. Okay. Is there anything that we need to do um, as we're going through this process? I know that in the past, Mr. Cohen has drawn a pretty hard line around um, new hiring. Um, and he didn't seem to do that as much, I think, in this last tri-board meeting. But is there anything that we need to do to, you know... Uh, no, I mean, we, we always do try to kind of stay in check as well because I understand and I know the town manager does on the town side, you know, adding FTEs to the budget right, and what that right. can, can do. 
I know that the town, I believe, has some additional positions, particularly around um, kind of the social work, mental health uh, service needs that the community members have. Right. Um, you know, I did communicate this with, with him, and I think he understands the needs of the schools. Um, you know, I, again, these are not, uh, these are direct service positions that are going to be helping um, students and families. Right. Um, these are largely, you know, kind of counseling, um, psychological right. support, particularly around the pandemic and, and some of the, um, the issues that we're seeing kids presenting with in schools at this point. Um, so I think they're very well warranted. I wouldn't recommend them. And, um, you know, we're on the same page as far as the recommendation goes and like what it can do to other areas of the budget. Um, when we make these additions, we're obviously living still within the budget allocation that we have. Um, I haven't asked for extra money, you know, beyond that. Um, I would love to say that some of these things are going to be temporary as we, you know, kind of get work through the, again, the pandemic and trying to get back to normal. Um, but I think these are very necessary things to be uh, considering right now. And I don't disagree at all um, with that. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's very thoughtful. You know, to have these things in place that we can support, you know, the kids and, and their families, really. Um, but I just wanted to make sure as we <coughs> are right. um, having to talk to the Finance Committee and then approaching town meeting that we've done our part in terms of, you know, giving a, a people a heads up and explaining them the, the necessity for these things. Um, because I think sometimes we do face questions about why are we adding right. you know, staff. No, and I'll, I'll certainly be prepared for that. Like I said, I've had the internal discussions with, with our staff and obviously with the town manager, uh, but I'll be prepared for those discussions with FinCom. Um, I think we certainly have the data to support these needs, and uh, just based on the number of students and the um, where some of them are in and, you know, even crisis and supports that are necessary, um, I honestly wouldn't recommend it if I didn't think we needed it. Agreed. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you and Joanna and your whole yes, staff for putting all this together. And that I'm, was always a. If I didn't thank Joanna ahead of time, thank you. <laughs> uh, Quite an undertaking. That was so. an oversight. So, no, it is. I think it's a good working document. I think it really does. Um, and again, it's important that we're all on the same page about this because this is kind of charting our um, course for next year. Um, so, please, again, take your time. I'm happy to talk through it. Um, answer any questions you have, produce any additional data you might have. But I think in addition to providing the good services we're already providing, these are really some, some critical steps in the right, in my opinion, in the right um, direction going forward to keep us moving. Um, not, not obviously just kind of sitting for another year. Yeah. And again, people at home, feel free to you know, email us with your comments, your questions, and we'll definitely uh, discuss them at a future meeting. Yep. All right. Uh, last item, I think, is the Update on the COVID mitigation yeah, so strategy. Just a little bit of an update for you on um, COVID mitigation. I shared with you a copy of a letter that I had sent to um, families um, about two weeks or so ago, maybe a week and a half ago, um, when the Commissioner of Ed and the Governor announced an alternative program for districts to consider with regard to updating kind of COVID mitigation strategies and uh, obviously working to try to keep students in school as much as possible. Um, control and mitigate the spread of COVID within the schools. And I think we've done a really good job with that since the very outset of the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we've actually um, seen, and I was kind of happy to see the state um, give us some alternatives to consider, um, is as a district, we have we've basically adopted every strategy that was made available to us from the very get-go. So when, uh, say, pool testing came along, a lot of districts didn't even jump to that. You know, we were one of the first districts to actually jump on, and we had, you know, over a thousand of our uh, staff and students on a weekly basis participating in pool testing right out of the gate, which is a huge, uh, huge undertaking. And then we said, in addition to pool testing, um, let's do test and stay, because if there ever were a positive case within the school, let's identify, obviously that person needs to isolate, but let's identify who are close contacts, and let's you know, allow them to test every day to be able to stay in school and maintain their learning and not have there be disruptions. And one of the things that we learned from that is, as one of the data uh, pieces here indicates, um, we have in Chelmsford been hugely successful, I think, in, in limiting the spread of, of COVID within the schools. Um, you know, over 99% of the tests that we've actually administered in test and safe since the beginning um, have been negative. So just to quantify that for you, we've done about 4,600 tests, you know, every single morning of, you know, over the course of this past year. And out of that 4,600, we've only had 37 positive cases. And we do track the data by case, by school, by day, 
to even see if you had a positive case in a particular class and Donna and Jeff and John were identified as a close contacts and, you know, Donna happened to test positive, well, did Jeff and John? And, you know, what we've been able to prove is basically no. So, you know, it, certainly we can attribute that to be not like a school close contact. You don't know what students may have done outside of school. Um, or, again, maybe Donna was closer than Jeff was to a particular student, but I think we've done a really good job of minimizing and mitigating uh, that spread. Uh, so one of the things that the state did is they also realized just the uh, enormous amount of time and effort that is going into managing COVID and keeping kids in school and even on this test and stay program. And most districts like us really have at our elementary schools, um, you know, as an example, one nurse. Um, and we're asking that one nurse to do um, COVID care management for their entire school, to do test and stay, to help out with pool testing, to send communications out to all these different people. It was just getting to be overwhelming. When again, 99% of the time that they were spending and 99% of the tests that they were administering were negative. Um, so the state, again, looking at statewide, it was like 98%. We were actually a little bit higher than the state. So 98% of all these cases were coming up negative across the state. So they said, and I also agree, that we need to kind of update and continue to evolve with our mitigation strategies and focus on the actual students who are sick or focus on the actual positive cases um, because we don't want them slipping through the cracks because we're spending so much time on the negative cases. Um, again, no one wants to um, uh, give up any of the things we're doing. We're not trying to do it you know, quicker or easier or whatnot. But we really want to focus on those students who do test positive to make sure that we're communicating proactively with their parents around, um, you know, here's the quarantine period, here's the date where we recommend you take another test before you come back to school, here's the first day you can possibly come back to school if you're not showing symptoms or your symptoms are improving or whatnot. We want to really focus on, at this point, kind of managing those cases and managing the positives that we have. Um, you will have seen since Christmas, you know, we actually spiked. We hit, we hit a good uh, uptick in uh, numbers in our community and across the state. And honestly, this is something that I wish had gone into place before Christmas because it almost looks statewide like a little reactionary to the spike that people can't keep up with. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I am happy to report that when we publish this Thursday, you'll see a significant decline in numbers. I think um, as of this afternoon, again, you never know what's going to happen overnight. But we had under 50 kids in the district uh, positive, and it was close to like 300 a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I think we were down to like 12 staff over the course of the whole last week that were positive. So those numbers are really, I think, kind of trending in the right direction. So what the uh, state is allowing districts to do and what I've opted in uh, for us to do is basically um, shift from test and stay in the buildings to at-home um, testing. So it, the teachers are right around coming back from uh, the Christmas holiday break. They made um, at-home test kits available. That's another story. But uh, they made them uh, available to uh, staff to be able to kind of take on tests before they came home. They've now launched that program for any interested students or staff to be able to uh, test weekly at home um, as kind of a safeguard to, to check again. It's a rapid antigen uh, test. That when coupled with pool testing, right? So as a district, if you're going to opt into this program, you have to do one of two things. You either have to continue to run pool testing in your district or you have to provide um, uh, symptomatic testing. Uh, we, we never signed up for symptomatic testing. Um, our feeling was that you would actually be encouraging or having people come to school to be, who are sick to be tested, uh, and we didn't want to do that. So from the very get-go, we never applied into that program. We don't have the medical authorization to run that particular program. We said we were going to do surveillance testing through pool testing. Um, so that's one of the options you have to maintain. So we're maintaining uh, pool testing, and we're still testing over 1,000, 1,500 uh, staff and students who want to each week. And that is kind of a molecular laboratory confirmed, kind of a PCR, the gold standard uh, test. So families and staff have the ability to do in-school PCR testing once a week. And then if they sign up to voluntarily um, accept a test kit from us uh, every other week, because there are two kits, there are two tests in each box, Every other week on a Friday, this is going to be the first Friday. We actually got our test today. Uh, that worked out well. Um, they're going to go home with the test kit. So you would take, you know, one test uh, each week. And if you're positive at home, if you're signing up for this program, you have to tell us. 
so that we can then track you and uh, figure out when you should come back to school and when you shouldn't come back to school. If you're negative, you don't tell us. We don't need to know if you're negative. You only have to tell us if you're positive. But the combination between a weekly at-home test and what we're going to recommend doing is spacing it from when the school does pool testing. So if we're doing pool testing in the school on Monday, and we're still encouraging people to do that, then you're probably going to want to take your home antigen test on Thursday. Because if you pull test on Monday, we're going to get the results on Tuesday. If you're negative, then let's have your test on, say, Thursday before coming to school and going into the weekend. Um, so there are directions that are going to come out to that. But uh, even if you make a mistake, the, the premise is you'll test once at home during the week. You'll test once in school through pool testing if you want to. And that will then be our surveillance testing. So by doing this program, what we then uh, eliminate is basically... Um, the test and stay program within the buildings. And because again, it's proven that we're not identifying uh, students through test and stay to keep them in school um, and also contact tracing. So we won't be contact tracing anymore because we're doing the at-home antigen test and we're doing the poll testing. And I do think that that is much more manageable as far as now working with the uh, students who actually are positive. Um, it'll free up our nurses, it'll free up our admin to really work with that segment of the population still maintaining the high level of, again, the mitigation we want, the cleaning, the hygiene, that's not going away. We're just shifting out pool testing and contact tracing for uh, at-home tests. And I just happened to look before we came into the meeting, and since I sent out the communication, we've got 2,800 uh, people have signed up for this option. Um, so I think that's a great number. You know, we have uh, 2,800 uh, kits will be going on Friday to staff and students who consented. Um, again, this will be the first test. The other the way it happens to line up also in two weeks time will be the Friday before February vacation. So they'll get a second test kit to bring home that week. Obviously they won't be in pool testing because school's closed, but they'll be able to take the test, you know, the Sunday or the Monday before coming back to school after the, after the break. Um, so again, I do very much think this is the way to, uh, to move forward with, um, you know, I'm very happy that we have that many people already signing up. I just kind of keep hitting that messaging in the newsletters, and I actually sent this as a separate letter because I wanted to get some attention to it and not have it just be buried in the newsletter. Um, and I think actually after a week of, of advertisement and 2,800 people being involved or, or signing up for the to participate is a real strong number for us. Very positive. So, um, a little long-winded, but I wanted to kind of give you that, um, uh, that overview. Um, obviously, I'll report back to you and let you know how the first week of test distribution goes. Um, we will, we, and this, this question has actually come up. We are still tracking all of the positive cases. So if you are positive at home through this program and you tell us you're tracked and you're appearing on a dashboard, if you bought your own kit, you know, at CVS or whatnot, and you're positive and you let the school know that, then we also report that through our system and you're on the, uh, the weekly dashboard. And that's the way how we're going to communicate uh, these positive cases, you know, going forward. We also have the pool testing results because, again, we're the ones getting the results. We can post those also to the website. So we're going to maintain weekly the COVID dashboard that actually lists how many positive staff and student cases we've had in each building. We're going to maintain the dashboard of um, pool testing so that we can also kind of use that as a metric to see how we're doing with our testing initiative. Um, and I'm kind of excited about this shift and being able to, um, uh, to get these in the hands of staff and students who are interested to be able to, again, kind of take that next, next step as we move towards um, at-home surveillance testing. And again, I'm just happy that uh, people signed up and, and want to give it a try. Okay. So the sign-up has been for getting the tests. The test kits. How about for pool testing? Has that changed in any way in terms of sign-ups? Um, I honestly didn't look before coming in today, mm -hmm. but um, we have been running, I want to say, about maybe twelve to 1,500 per week, um, pool testing-wise. I have to see. Any, I mean, anyone can still sign up. Right. I haven't looked like this week to see if we have many more. And okay. We'll get that update, though, in the next mm -hmm. meeting anyways. We usually do a second meeting. We'll get the number update. Next Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday. Oh, yeah, no, I'll have that update for you for next Tuesday. Yeah. I just didn't look before coming into this meeting. I was just looking to see how many people had actually signed up for the at-home. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? So basically this is an honor system. Right. Course, mm -hmm. right? So a kid could potentially test positive at home but still decide not to report it and come to school. Again, 
they could do that now anyway. Yes, uh, I agree. And I think what we have tried to really work with our families, and really the vast, vast majority have been very forthcoming. If someone is sick, they're not sending their student in. We've had a couple of instances where we've even found, say, a student after the fact was you know, positive because we might pick it up through Peggy still working with the Board of Health and right. the state system. Um, on a positive note, the family kept the student home because they were positive. They just didn't connect with the school nurse, so it's not like they sent their student um, sick. But when the messaging goes out on this, yes, it is. I mean, you had to consent to be in the program. So I'm hoping that those parents who consented for the kids, you know, if there was a positive test, would let us know. Um, the Again, the quarantine period is actually now less than it was in the very beginning. Um, but they're really, I mean, to answer your first question, there's nothing stopping them from doing it now. Um, but the parents we have participating, well, for the most part, have been really good. Um, it is voluntary, though. You know, so you don't have to participate, even in, like, the pool testing. Um, it's it's voluntary. We can't make people participate. That, at least, we get the results, and, you know, we will be able to figure out who the positive person is. Um, but we haven't had many issues with that. People have been very forthcoming in that program, too. Yeah, I agree. When we um, when the home test became available, it was kind of a game changer in terms of being able to track these things. And having started the program last week in my school, it tests, you know, Right. Quick, done, you know, two minutes, wait 10 minutes to get your results, and, you know, so it's 15. not. All right, 50. All right. Uh, no so, all right. let, yes, so let's say I test positive. I'm going to quarantine for five days, okay? Jeff sits next to me in class. He's not going to quarantine. Right. He's not considered a close contact because we're not contact tracing, but it would be really incumbent upon him to do his own testing, right, to determine whether or not he could have potentially, um, you know, picked up right. something it, from me. It's almost becoming incumbent on everyone. Right. to kind of do their own surveillance testing to check themselves regularly so that they're not infecting others. Um, I think the other thing that had to play into this also statewide, um, but even like when I look at our data, our vaccination rates are really uh, picking up, you know, and everyone has been um, able to be vaccinated at this point in time who's school-aged. Um, I know there's even a uh, potential, I think, for the younger, you know, the under fives to be vaccinated, you know, either now or soon too. Um, but even when you were doing your contact tracing, you know, if we have, again, I think our high school is probably up to like 86, 87 percent now. Um, eight out of nine out of ten kids or staff members are vaccinated. There's a good chance that Jeff was vaccinated anyway. And he's not going to be participating in test and stay because he was vaccinated. He's just going to be self-monitoring. I think, if anything, this now gives you the ability to do an at-home test in addition to the PCR test. And I think these are a little bit easier to come by. But they're still expensive. Yes. So if you have a family of a few of a few um, yeah. you know kids or whatnot, you're still paying you know twenty twenty five dollars for dollars, yeah. yeah for for a box, um, and this is just like a great in my opinion a great free initiative to be able to do that kind of broad um, surveillance testing. So I only ask these questions just to make sure people are clear I, right, yeah. at home. All right, my last question. <laughs> Let's say I'm a, a student and I haven't signed up for the home tests and I'm yeah. not involved in the pool testing, but I come to school and I show symptoms, mm -hmm. okay? Um, would I be sent home? Yes. Okay, would I have to have a, uh, uh, just, I would be sent home for the five days, but I don't necessarily have to have a test well, in order to be able to come back. That's It's really a, a nurse decision okay. in the school with regard to what are your symptoms, how many symptoms do you have? Right. Um, I have had situations where the nurse will um, say the student has to go home because of suspicion of this. You know, go see your doctor. You need a doctor's note to come back. Um, we've been very supportive of the nurses. If the nurses make that call, um, we'll stand by them. And the student needs to, you know, either quarantine for the period of time if they refuse to test or go to their doctor and, and get a test. Right. Um, go to a, um, a walk-in, you know, get a test and have some kind of proof that they've tested negative. This would only be because they've come to school and they're showing symptoms. Symptoms. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, again, we don't do the um, symptomatic testing on right. site. If I think the other advantage of this program, too, though, is let's say that did happen and someone, um, you know, was told to, you know, they had to get a doctor's note or whatever, you can opt into this program really any time. Okay. So um, whether the pool testing or this program, now, there is a little bit of a lag because I have to order the tests every other week. So, like, if you didn't sign up by last Friday, then technically you can't participate in this Friday's round. Um, I think we're going to be able to cover everyone who's basically consented at this point. 
Um, but if you missed it, all you have to do is go online, sign up, and then that week you'll get your test kit. Okay. Um, so it's a good opportunity to, to still do that. I think the people who really want to test and know that they're um, you know, positive and, and stay away from people are going to do the right thing. Um, and I think that's honestly at the, at the place we're at. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Great. How if do. there were exemptions for kids who have already had COVID, what happens with them? Um, yeah, to get the actual medical thing, I'd have to defer to Peggy or the one of the nurses on this, but there's like a 90 day uh, window where mm -hmm. if you have had COVID, um, then you, we don't want you to participate in our pool testing for the 90 days because it's highly likely you're going to throw a, a pool off. Mm -hmm. Um, very similarly to this, I think, you know, I don't want to talk anecdotally, so I'll defer to the uh, medical people. I think if what I found or anecdotally what we've heard is that if people really aren't symptomatic at the time, <clears throat> let's say you're a week, I mean, you're a month, two months removed, you're not likely to test positive on the at-home test, where you may on the PCR test because it's it's just a... Um, it's way more sensitive. more sensitive. Much more sensitivity. The sensitivity load is higher. Okay. I'm just glad to see there's more options. <clears throat> that's that's what I'm really happy for. And My I'm, kids are already signed up. I'm pretty sure Cindy was like immediately. We're just yeah. taking the burden off the nurses and yep. the administrators right. yep. who've been working their tails off yep. since yep. September and especially this last month. So mm -hmm. to give them a ability to concentrate on the kids that are sick. So and again, if if we'd only seen a hundred, a couple hundred kids or, or a staff even sign up, you know, I'd be kind of questioning the efficacy of this. But with close to three thousand in the district, yeah. you know, I definitely think it's a good way to go, yeah. and to. Um, I'll be able to then report results to you as we go. Yeah. And again, I was a little suspect after we did the whole teacher thing at uh, Christmas break and the tests were coming, they weren't coming, they were coming, uh, but they actually arrived today. So um, <laughs> they came, Donna. <laughs> uh, they came today. Jeff. What's that? So that's one for Jeff. Yeah, you got to give him, give him credit. So, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so they'll be going out uh, Friday uh, to staff and family. So we're going to, we have a meeting tomorrow to figure out how that's all going to roll up. But on a positive note, the test physically came. So if they came the first week I ordered them, I feel pretty confident going forward. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody have any liaison reports? I have met. Um, well, we participated in um, the steering committee for um, oh, strategic planning. Yeah. yeah, strategic planning. And that went... Well, well, yeah. All right. Um, I attended school PTO. Um, met last week, I believe it, and uh, they're busy as always. All the PTOs are. Um, they continue to provide enrichment. Um, they're trying to. The goal is to give uh, each grade level three enrichment activities during the course of the year. They've already done one or two. Um, they provided some classroom supplies for teachers, kind of to restock them after halfway through the year. Um, they're big fundraisers coming up, so they've always done a taste of Chelmsford with COVID. They've kind of gone to a calendar raffle uh, instead with all different restaurants on there. But so I believe that's now available online. Uh, you can get it through their Facebook page for Santa School. Uh, and they're very, very excited about the new playground. Um, yeah. you know, now that they've, they've gotten their funding all in line, um, they're working on the design plans. They're getting ready to order the materials, um, hoping to get the work done over the summer. Uh, the one thing they did mention is, is just, again, continued concerns about Overcrowding the new developments. I guess there's a new development at Gorham Street there they're concerned about, um, you know, and more students coming in there. So, you know, just to keep an eye on that type of stuff is sure. just what they wanted the message. Um, and the other one, P, uh, CHIPS PTO, is they have a meeting next Monday on the 7th. Uh, it's a virtual meeting. Um, they're also having a virtual information session uh, tomorrow night uh, from 6 to 7 for anybody interested in, in the CHIPS program. So I had those two. Uh -huh. I would say, too, for teachers, um, I know that when I attended the um, Chelsea Friends of um, Music uh, meeting, uh, that they have some money available for teachers interested in, um, you know, uh, special projects. I know that they had supplied some keyboards in the past and ukuleles. Nobody had signed up for that. And I think people have a lot going on, of course, and it makes it hard to think about anything other than just you know, getting from one day to the next. But these monies are available, and I would encourage people to use them. This is the C farm themselves? Yes, this is just CFOM. And the other is, um, over the course of uh, last spring, I had um, some organizations reach out to me. Um, no students applied for their scholarships, so to make sure that kids are checking the College and Career Center and taking um, advantage of, you know, opportunities that, that may be there, be, but 
there were uh, three or four organizations that said no one even submitted an application. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, anyone have any new items they want to bring up at this point? Uh, just a reminder, our next meeting is next Tuesday. So uh, we, we're going right back into it. So if anybody has any agenda items for our next meeting, if you just get them to me, you know, next day or two, um, we'll try to include them on there. And then also tonight, I, I, this afternoon, I, I had a request from the select board. They, they need to um, to meet to appoint um, a member for Neshoba Valley again and an alternative. So they throw uh, two possible dates, the 14th and the 28th. Oh, these are March, by the way, March 14th and 28th. So people could look at their calendars and see if, if, if either of those dates work. Um, and I'll just send an email out later in the week and uh, kind of finalize that. And we'll meet at that point. All right, uh, anyone have any public comments that came in? Uh, we did get a, an email earlier. Um, so I guess this could have gone on the good news too from uh, a parent, Laurie McCarran, um, and she just uh, had some complimentary things to say uh, about um, you know, a staff member in, in the, um, the Special Ed Department in general. Um, so her email is, even during the toughest of times, it's really great to have immediate attention of the Chancellor's administration, specifically Amy Reese, that takes time out of the day to listen to parents. Sending a much deserved public thank you. You're all working very hard to quote Amy Reese, the goal is the child. This is very reassuring and comfort during the toughest of times ever. So that was from Ms. McCarran. So Great. thank her to say for that. All right. Uh, any other things? Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Okay, thank you.